When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to Unshaken. I'm Jared Halverson, and I congratulate you for making it through the first book of Scripture. It only took us three months, uh, and we only have nine months to go, and every other book of the Old Testament to cover. So we're going to have to pick up some speed, right? Uh, but I do hope that your experience in Genesis uh, lived up to the name of the book, that you saw in it a Genesis of humanity in the story of creation, and Adam and Eve, a uh, genesis of our need for the atonement of Jesus Christ in the account of the fall. Our genesis of the covenant in stories like Enoch and Noah and covenant couples like Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Rachel. I hope you saw the genesis of your role in the house of Israel as personified by Joseph in Egypt these past two weeks to make sure that the bread of life is available to all of God's children. And on a more personal note, I hope you've seen in these last months of study a genesis for your love of the Old Testament. I hope you've been able to see relevance. That's been one of my greatest goals, to take the them there then into the us here now. And I pray that you've seen the Spirit work in their lives in ways that are similar to the ways He's working in yours. I really do hope that some of the, the tangents we've gone on or the asides that we take, these journeys in truth, I, I hope that they have answered not just questions, but prayers along the way. And I know that that's the power of God speaking through Scripture. But there's not some, oh, this is not, we're not preparing for scriptural jeopardy. Uh, there's not some multiple choice Scantron test at the end of life uh, to be able to regurgitate trivia uh, from Scripture, but rather, how did you live your life? And how good were you at living the first and second great commandments of loving God and loving neighbor? And that's what this book is all about. So I pray that Genesis served that purpose for you. And now we look forward to Exodus, which is such an incredible book as well. This one gets about a, a month this year as well. Uh, and then we really have to start flying. Uh, but talk about a book that deserves it. In some ways, in fact, Exodus, well, I'll put it this way. For the temple endowment, uh, because the Lord is trying to teach us through narrative, and, and couch truth in symbol and in, uh, in history, he could have chosen any number of, of scriptural stories. Uh, he chose creation and fall, which makes sense since creation, fall, atonement are the pillars of eternity and the story arc of, of every story in life. But he could have chosen the Exodus also. He could have chosen what we'll study this month in the book of Exodus as the template for the temple endowment. If you think about this journey oh, away from the presence of God, to come to earth, to wrestle with our natural men and women, uh, to learn truth and embrace it, to make covenants with God in hopes that someday we might return to Him. That is what the endowment is meant to convey. That's the, the lesson, the overarching lesson anyway, that, is, that it's meant to teach us. And the temple uses the creation fall account, that there we were in pre-mortality with God, but we came to earth. And, and had our experience in Eden only to fall and wrestle and struggle in this fallen world in hopes that someday, by making covenants with God and hearkening to the voice of His messengers, we'll be able to return to our Father in heaven. Well, think about it. That's the Exodus story also. Uh, the promised land was Canaan, promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But what happens? All the family falls to Egypt, so to speak. They leave the presence of the promise and go down into a fallen world. And in that experience of bondage, as we'll see today, will they hearken to messengers? Will they trust in God? Will they remember the covenant as God has remembered the covenant? So that eventually they can follow those chosen leaders back to the promised land. Uh, that's, this, that's the story arc as well. That's creation, fall, atonement. That's Exodus and well, down, uh, falling down to Egypt and then an exodus to return. That is the temple endowment. And, and that's the story of our lives. 
as we're trying to navigate mortality in hopes of, of finding our way back to our, our heavenly home. And so I look forward to meeting Moses today and coming to understand him as a type and shadow of Jesus Christ, just like Joseph was our last two weeks. Uh, pray for the Spirit to help you see yourself in these stories, and you will. So Exodus chapter 1, the first five verses review the 12 sons of Jacob. So we're, we're looking back and now ready to move forward. Where are we? Because it's amazing how, many, how much time has passed in those few short verses. By the time you get to verse 6, Joseph has died, all his brethren, and all that generation. So there's the passing of the guard. And during this time, verse 7, all the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. You get an echo of creation, of multiply and replenish the earth, Adam and Eve. You get a, a, the beginning of the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant that your posterity will be as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea. And that's beginning to happen there in Egypt. However, verse 8, there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Now the timeline can be a little tricky here, okay? So bear with me for just a moment. If you remember back in Genesis 15, when Abraham is marking the confines of covenant with that strange ritual, uh, he was told that for 400 years, his posterity would be strangers in a strange land. And that in the fourth generation, they would finally be able to return to this land of promise. Well, that's what's happening in those few short verses to begin the book of Exodus. Uh, the way Egyptian history unfolds uh, is it's called the second intermediate period. It's between the Middle Kingdom and the New Kingdom. And the rulers of Egypt were a group called the Hyksos which were of Semitic origin, this kind of foreigners have come in and, and they're ruling Egypt at the time. And if they're of Semitic origin, then the, the belief is they would be more open to having someone more like them, uh, namely Joseph, rule right alongside Pharaoh. Uh, so that during that, that second intermediate period, it would be a, a friendly kind of culture for for Canaanites, for Hebrews to move down and begin populating. It also helps explain some of the strange things we saw these last couple of weeks about Egyptians not wanting to eat meals with the Hebrews, for example, when Pharaoh doesn't seem to have those kinds of prejudices or problems, or the Egyptians thinking shepherding is an abomination, whereas Pharaoh's like, hey, Hebrews, your shepherd's great. Will you take care of my flocks and herds? Uh, again, that, that intermediate period in the Egyptian chronology does help make sense as far as when uh, Joseph would squeeze into that, into that timeline. And when a new pharaoh would come that not only knows not Joseph, but is in no way connected to the Hyksos or to the Hebrews and is pure Egyptian again, so to speak. No wonder he comes onto the scene and wonders, what are all of these, these Canaanites doing here? What are, why is... Egypt, our land being inf infiltrated or infested with these Hebrews. Uh, no wonder then it turns into bondage, as we'll see in the next few verses. Before I go there, though, I, I would say there's a danger, speaking more generally, when our political leaders know not God. Uh, and so for this Pharaoh to know not Joseph, nor the God of Joseph, is going to spell disaster for the descendants of Joseph. I sometimes worry about a rising generation that knows not fill in the blank. Uh, we're at a point where we are losing the final members of that greatest generation of World War II veterans. And to think of what they were able to accomplish and the level of self-sacrifice and heroism, and, and we don't know them anymore personally. I've sometimes felt the need to keep Elder Maxwell's memory alive among the rising generation, for example. I quote him all the time to my institute students, and they look like, wait, who is that? You need to know Elder Maxwell. Uh, do you know, it, it, do we have a generation that grows up not knowing Ezra Taft Benson and his emphasis on the Book of Mormon? Do we have a generation? I was a generation that grew up not knowing David O. McKay, but hearing stories from my parents or reading his, his teachings. Do we have a generation that knows not Joseph Smith or knows not the incredible heroes and heroines of church history or of scriptural history? And there's something that happens when we lose that institutional memory uh, that can spell disaster for our testimonies, uh, for our faith. So let's keep those memories alive. 
Now, back to our narrative in verse 9, this new Pharaoh says unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Now, evidently, he doesn't remember, or perhaps has chosen to forget, that the might of Egypt itself is owing to one of those children of Israel. That if it weren't for Joseph, then, then Egypt itself would have been brought to its knees during the, that period of famine. But having forgotten that, Pharaoh says in verse 10, Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Now, notice he was saying, let's deal wisely. But his plan was anything but wise. The thought of they're more and mightier than we, if an enemy comes and declares war on us, no doubt these Hebrews will join them instead of joining us. And part of me wants to think, that's a pretty lousy military strategy, Pharaoh. If they're already here and have become Egyptian in a certain way, wouldn't they have some loyalties, especially if you treat them well? Based on Joseph's experience, there's an Egyptian past for these Hebrews too. And so to defend that country. Instead, he's making this a self-fulfilling prophecy that by the way he's treating them, then of course when the enemy comes, they are going to join the enemy because Egypt, Egypt itself, Pharaoh, has become an enemy of these people directly. So dealing wisely, anything but. Now verse 11, Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. Interesting that Joseph built granaries, whereas this Pharaoh builds treasuries. One leader was trying to feed the people and the other was trying to fleece the people. And so rather than providing, I am going to take from them all that I can and turn these Hebrews from, from protectors of the realm and from contributors to the kingdom and turn them into slaves instead. And like I said about that self-fulfilling prophecy, laying burdens upon them will only make them stronger and afflicting them will only make them more likely to rebel. He's pursuing a path, Pharaoh is, that will bring the exact opposite of what he's hoping to accomplish. Well, verse 12, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. That's usually how it works. Adversity makes us strong after all. And they, the Egyptians, were grieved because of the children of Israel. Grieved over them when they could have shared in their joy. No, there was this opposition. There was this prejudice now. In verse 13 then, the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, again, which is only going to strengthen them. They made their lives bitter with hard bondage, again, only making them more likely to rebel. That bondage would be in mortar and in brick and all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. Next week, when we get to the plagues of Egypt and the Passover, we'll see the symbolism of those bitter herbs, hearkening back to the bitterness of bondage. But so far, Everything Pharaoh's doing is backfiring. Remember when, when a Pharaoh was there who knew Joseph and, and trusted his Midas touch, allowing the, the presence of this man of God to make a huge difference in the land of Egypt. The opposite is happening, happening now, and nothing that Pharaoh is doing is, is accomplishing his goals. Well, what's his next plan? It's even worse. Verse 15, The king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other, Pua. And he said, when ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, giving birth that is, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him, but if it be a daughter, then she shall live. Whenever I've taught the Old Testament, or even in my Women in the Scriptures classes, I've often asked my students about biblical names that they might consider name, using when they name their children. And of course, there's Sarah's and Rebecca's and Rachel's out there. There are Jacob's and Joseph's. Uh, but there's not a lot of Zebulun's or Issachar's, and there's certainly not a lot of Shifra's and Pua's. And when I mention those names to them, they're like, who? And I think, ah, that's tragic, because we have their names memorialized in Scripture. And you want to talk about two women who deserve it? It's Shifra and Pua. In fact, it's ironic that the mightiest man on earth at the time is the Pharaoh of the Exodus. And yet the scriptures leave him completely unnamed. Archaeologists or, or Hollywood directors might suggest that it's Ramses, but we don't know for sure. 
And in some ways I say, good, because he's not worth remembering. He's the villain in the story. And yet, who is remembered? These Hebrew midwives. These women who made sure that a rising generation would actually be there to rise, to rise up and revolt against their masters. It's Israel owes its existence in some ways to these two easily forgotten women, but their names are preserved here. I've sometimes asked uh, my students in the Book of Mormon year, can you name any of the stripling warriors? And they can't, which lets you know that the kingdom of God can be saved by a bunch of no-namers, as was the case with Helam and stripling warriors. Um, Captain Moroni's servant who scalps Zarahemna and helps save the day in that battle. What's his name? We don't know. It's not preserved. And to me, there's something significant about that, that you and I, it was easily forgotten by, you know, by history or by the, the, the famous or the, the prominent, always remembered by God to the point that he will include their names in Scripture. I remember years ago taking a class on the New Testament, and the professor was trying to help us understand the difference between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John as far as their approach was concerned. And one of the things he said about the book of Mark was that it sometimes included uh, extraneous detail. Uh, information that really wasn't necessary. And then he used an example of one time only in the book of Mark where it says that Jesus was healing a man that was blind and it gave him his name and said, oh, this was oh, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. And the professor said, see, there's an example. Nobody needs to know that. That's an extraneous detail. And I thought to myself, even at the time, well, it wasn't extraneous to Bartimaeus, uh, nor was it extraneous or unnecessary information to the Lord. I love the fact that here's a blind beggar. How many homeless beggars do we know by name? Well, the Lord knows them all intimately. And so for Jesus to see a, a forgotten character, a castaway character, someone that no, it doesn't even, isn't worth our time remembering names and extraneous details. And the Lord's like, oh, Bartimaeus, how you doing? Uh, how's Timaeus, your father? To know who we are and who we come from and all of our backstory and all of our potential, that's the Lord. And so to name Shifra and Pua is an important detail. I hope their names will be remembered more frequently by you and me. I also want to point out one other interesting thing here, and that's that they were told, kill the boys. But the girls, eh, that's okay. You can let them live. If there were ever a mistake that Pharaoh made in, in Exodus chapter 1, it was underestimating the power and potential of the daughters of God, the women of Israel. Because the irony uh, throughout this book, most of the heroes in the book of Exodus are actually heroines. We focus on Moses as the great deliverer of Israel, but who delivered the deliverer? Well, Shifra and Pua, or midwives like them. Who else came to deliver this deliverer? How about his mother, Yocheved? How about his sister, Miriam? How about his stepmother, if you can call her that, uh, this adopted child, Pharaoh's daughter? How about Zipporah, Moses' wife? From almost every angle looking on at the life of Moses, it was a woman who prepared him or preserved him to fulfill the mission that was uniquely his. So in some ways, Pharaoh, you picked the wrong gender. If you were going to, to try to destroy the house of Israel, I suppose you should have taken aim at the daughters, as much as, if not more than, the sons, the mothers, as much as, if not more than, the fathers. Satan is not making the same mistake that Pharaoh did. And he is targeting the daughters of God in merciless ways trying to rob from them their sense of identity, their sense of uniqueness, their spiritual gifts and spiritual strength. He's gone from telling women that they are inferior to men to telling them they're in superior to men or telling them that they're oh, better off independent of men or identical to men when the, the uniqueness of the gifts that God has given his daughters and his sons meant to be complementary that the rib removed from Adam and then returned, symbolically speaking, is two halves becoming whole. 
neither one sufficient by themselves. Verse 17 gives us one reason why Pharaoh should have been more concerned about the power and potential of righteous women. It says that the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. They feared God more than they feared man, including Pharaoh, the scariest man on earth. No, they were willing to risk their own lives in order to preserve the lives of others. Oh, that's not just the role of a midwife here in Exodus. That's the role of a mother every time they give birth. We saw that with Rachel and Benjamin, that they are willing to pass through the valley of the shadow of death in order to bring life into existence on the other side. Such was the courage of Shifra and Pua and their, their sister saints. Now in verse 18, the king of Egypt called for the midwives. He's angry and said unto them, why have you done this thing? and have saved the men children alive. And the midwives' response in 19 is interesting. They say, well, because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. In other words, we just can't get there in time. The, the deliveries of these Hebrew women, these mothers, are so, are so rapid. They don't even need our help. They can bring children into the world without the kind of assistance that that the women of Egypt require. Now, what they're suggesting here is that there is a difference between the women of God and the women of the world. The word lively is an interesting term. It could also be translated as vigorous or having the vigor of life. Uh, there's a connection to the word for community, which is interesting, this liveliness in terms of community view, thinking more of others than thinking of themselves, which describes Shifra and Pua to a T. But go back to that first phrase. The Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women. One of the most famous quotes about womanhood comes from Spencer W. Kimball. I love this one. He said way back in 1979, much of the major growth that is coming to the church in the last days will come because many of the good women of the world, here's the Egyptians, in whom there is often such an inner sense of spirituality, will be drawn to the church in large numbers. This will happen to the degree that the women of the church reflect righteousness and articulateness in their lives, and to the degree that the women of the church are seen as distinct and different in happy ways from the women of the world. I love what President Kimball's saying there. The women of the world will be drawn into the church because, why? Because the women of the church are different that people will notice the same things that these midwives are describing, that women of God are just different from women of the world. They stand out. They are distinct in happy ways. That's the irony, too. Sometimes women of the world think, why, are you, why aren't you more up in arms over your position in, in your church? And the women of God often will smile and say, because we understand our position is an exalted one. Mothers in Israel, daughters of divine parents, with, with divinity within each of us, the chance to grow and progress, to become more like our mother in heaven, not just our father in heaven. Oh, the, the, the empowerment of sisters in the Relief Society to understand the role of women in the kingdom of God is it's ennobling, it's empowering. And so in happy ways to recognize that, I've always been struck by the words, they will reflect articulateness in their lives. And I used to think, wait, they have to be eloquent. Is that what, he, what he's saying? Well, it might help, but I think more than importantly is, can you articulate why you're different? Women of the church, are they able to put into words? Are they able to articulate why they're so happy in their differences? Here you see these Hebrew midwives trying to articulate that to Pharaoh. Uh, are, we, are we striving to do likewise? One who was incredibly articulate, uh, in, no, not only in her ability to articulate, but doing so in an amazingly eloquent way, was Margaret Nadold, General Young Women's President years ago. And she made a statement way back in 2000 that's been repeated ever since, uh, so powerful. She said that women of God can never be like women of the world. The world has enough women who are tough. We need women who are tender. There are enough women who are coarse, 
We need women who are kind. There are enough women who are rude. We need women who are refined. We have enough women of fame and fortune. We need more women of faith. We have enough greed. We need more goodness. We have enough vanity. We need more virtue. We have enough popularity. We need more purity. And I will be forever grateful that I was raised by a mother and a grandmother that exemplify those terms. I think of what Paul says to Timothy that you owe your faith to your mother Eunice and your grandmother Lois. I feel the same with my mother and grandmother. I am, my wife and I, to think of being equally yoked with someone on the caliber of my companion, who again exemplifies that statement from Sister Nadold and the one from President Kimball, as we strive to, ri to raise daughters that will exemplify that as well. I just love that phrase. There's something about these midwives turning to Pharaoh and saying, I'm so sorry. There's just something about these Hebrew women. They're so lively. They're so, they don't need our help bringing their children into the world. In fact, there you can almost switch the metaphor. And yes, these are Hebrew midwives doing a good service, but I think sometimes we turn to Egypt to deliver our children. Sometimes we expect Egyptian ways will be best. Uh, and we turn to them on, with, for guidance on how to raise the next generation. I hope we are quicker than that. I hope that we can give birth and wean our children and raise them in righteousness before Egypt can, can influence them in unfortunate ways. That'll take a lot of lively parenting on our part as well. Well, verse 20, we see the aftermath. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. And by houses he means households, families, in other words. Another way to translate that could be palaces or even temples. But to think of these midwives bringing other children into the world, God is providing to them children of their own. And that, again, is the promise God makes to his daughters. If you will do your best in raising the next generation, whether you gave birth to them or not, if you lean into that mother heart that Sherry do so beautifully described, then the day will come in this life or the next that you will have houses of your own to raise. A beautiful promise. The chapter then ends, verse 22, with Pharaoh charging all his people saying, every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. In other words, fine, Pharaoh thinks. Uh, if, these, if these midwives are standing in the way, assuming he doesn't believe their story, or simply unnecessary if he happens to believe them, then let's, let's circumvent them. Let's get around the need for midwives. Anytime you see a baby boy, just toss them in the river. Oh, let the girls live. There's nothing to worry about. Again, that will be your ultimate mistake, Pharaoh. I chuckle too to think that, well, in a way, Moses' parents kept that rule. They did put their son into the river. They just didn't do it quite the way Pharaoh envisioned. We'll see that unfold in chapter 2, where we finally meet Moses, our, our hero for the rest of this book and others. Verse 1, there went a man of the house of Levi, and took to wife a daughter of Levi. In the Joseph story, we got a chance for Reuben and Simeon and Judah to stand out and prove that they had changed. Well, now we get the opportunity to learn of Levi, or in this case, at least a descendant, a pair of descendants from the tribe of Levi. In Exodus 6, at the end of this week's material, we'll actually get to know their names. He's listing the descendants of Reuben and Simeon and Levi, and as it goes through Levi, it gets to this verse, Amram took him, Yocheved, his father's sister, to wife, and she bare him Aaron and Moses. So there we get their names. Amram and Yocheved, the father and mother of Moses and Aaron, and Miriam, who we'll meet in a moment. Now it's said that Yocheved was Amram's father's sister, so his aunt, which I know seems really strange by modern sensibilities, but don't forget Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob and Rachel and Leah were all related to each other before they got married to one another, okay? It was more normal in that time period. But most of the time, it seems like it would be a cousin or a niece, and in this case, an aunt. Was she older than Amram? 
We don't know the details. It could have been younger if it was a big family with a lot of kids and she was the youngest, something along those lines. But if she was older, why not married already? Was she widowed? Had she always been single? Was she passed over by people who didn't see just who this incredible daughter of Le the Levites was? Uh, maybe a Leah sort of situation. I'm not sure. But this is a woman of incredible faith and fortitude, as we're about to see. In verse 2, the woman conceived, and then the bad news, and bare a son. Can you imagine the devastation? Well, I mean, the emotional roller coaster a mother would be on. So excited to be pregnant, to be able to bring forth a child. How important that was in terms of the Abrahamic covenant. And yet, you've got a 50-50 chance that there will be rejoicing or absolute devastation. And so, to give birth with all the hope in your heart, this, this is the tragedy of a stillborn or a miscarriage where you have paid such a price to bring a child into the world and all of that hope turns into absolute anguish when you realize you will not have the chance to raise this baby that you have that you have been bringing into existence well, she conceives the good news. Bear a son, the devastating news. What are we going to do? The verse continues, When she saw him, that he was a goodly child. That word, goodly, we think of Nephi, goodly parents. It can mean pleasant or agreeable or beautiful or choice or special or good. In fact, it's the same word used in the creation account when God looks at things and says, Ah, and it was good. Here's a mother looking at her baby he is a goodly child. I know Pharaoh required us to... Th I can't even say the words. There's no way I can do this. And so how does the verse end? With one of the most heroic acts any parent could go through. She hid him three months. Now Josephus adds this insight in his history, his Antiquities of the Jews. He says, if any parents should disobey him, meaning Pharaoh, and venture to save their male children alive, they and their families should be destroyed. So there's a, a Jewish historian at the time of Jesus hearkening back to this story and fleshing out some additional detail. That it wasn't just that Pharaoh would find out and say, I mean, this goes back to, even to the midwives. Uh, what was their danger if he, they had actually stood up to Pharaoh to his face and said, absolutely not, I, I, I refuse. There's death for them. Death they were probably willing to face. Well, same with Amram and Yocheved here of, if they find out that we have tried to preserve alive our son, if we have gone completely against the command of Pharaoh, it's not just that they will right what they perceive as the wrong and take our son and cast him into the river. They'll throw us all in right after him. They will make sure that the whole, the whole family is in danger as they decide to, to strive to preserve the life of their son, their little brother. And three months? Can you imagine that? I mean, I couldn't even make it through sacrament meeting when my kids were little without them crying out. Uh, and no amount of Cheerios or coloring books could, could stop them. Uh, to, to imagine three months on constant high alert, ceaseless stress, that if there's a cry and if the, the guards of Pharaoh happen to be walking through the streets of the alleyways of Goshen, no doubt they're going to come and look to see the gender of the baby. I have to keep this infant, this newborn, absolutely silent, or we all die. How can you, for three months, how can, I'm, I'm shocked they lasted that long. No wonder verse 3 comes, and when she could no longer hide him, by the way, that word hide, she hid him for three months, also means to treasure up which is exactly what she'd been doing these three months, treasuring every moment with this baby. But when she could no longer do that, no longer hide him, no longer keep the treasure concealed, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein 
and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. Well, you think of an ark, we can't help but think of Noah, that God himself was putting all that would hearken to his words, all of his cherished creation into this ark that Enoch tells us he held in his own hands. Picture this loving mother and loving father holding this baby, laying him in an ark that they had pitched within and without with pitch, covering it, atoning for it, uh, like we saw in the story of Noah, and then laying, <laughs> if only I could keep it in my hands, but I will have to commend it to the hands of God and place it in the river, which the Nile, there is the super freeway of ancient Egypt. And so to place it in the, in the flags by the river's brink, there's no guarantee of continued safety there. I kept thinking, what's the modern equivalent? Is it strapping a car seat to a, to a skateboard and then sending it down the freeway? I don't know, even if, but this is something, how do I do this? How do I commend my child? How do I send it out of my hands? Well, I can't unless I know I can send it into the hands of God. In fact, back to Josephus, he indicates that Amram had received through a dream knowledge that his son would be the promised deliverer of all of Israel. He related this dream to his wife, and together they decide we are going to do all within our power to preserve the life of this newborn. But, like I said, after three months, it's impossible to do that. So they determined rather to entrust the safety and care of the child to God than to depend on their own concealment of him, which they looked upon as a thing uncertain. But they believed that God would some way for certain procure the safety of the child in order to secure the truth of his own predictions. In some ways, this is a trial of faith and a sacrifice on par with the sacrifice of Abraham and Isaac. To think of Isaac as, no, this is the son of the promise. You can't keep your covenant if, if I slay him. And similarly, if Josephus is right in, in describing this dream that, honey, we've just given birth to our deliverer, which means first we'll have to deliver him, but then getting to a point that they can't, they have to sacrifice their son, thinking that there must be some way that God will keep his word to us, even if we offer our child as a sacrifice. We have no idea what will come of him. Will he survive his experience on the Nile? What will his future be? There's Abraham trusting that somehow God will raise Isaac even from the dead as he goes through with this sacrifice. It's incredible the kinds of gut checks that God is asking of each, of each person here. Elder Hales, by the way, said something about this story that I found so beautiful. He said, like Yocheved, we raise our families in a wicked and hostile world, a world as dangerous as the courts of Egypt ruled by Pharaoh. But like Yocheved, we also weave around our children a protective basket, a vessel called the family, and guide them to safe places where our teachings can be reinforced in the home and at church. Along the way, at times when our children are away from us, the Lord provides inspired Miriams to watch over them. We'll see that in a moment. Special third-party helpers, such as priesthood and auxiliary leaders, teachers, extended family, worthy friends. That's such a beautiful thought. What are we doing to weave this ark? Are we pitching it within and without with the atonement of Christ to keep the water of the world out? Have we done all within our power to hide our children from the wicked world, to treasure them up unto us, and to prepare them as best we can for life out in Egypt? Do we weave around them a basket that can bear them up? And then do we commend them to God, praying that there will be others watching from a distance, helping to keep them safe? That's exactly what happens in the next verse, verse 4. His sister, this is Miriam, stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And in some ways that would foreshadow Miriam's ongoing role in Moses' life. I don't know the difference in age here, but this was an older sister that always kept her eyes on little brother, even when he had become mighty Moses, deliverer of Israel. 
Again, one more woman there to deliver the deliverer. In verse 5, the daughter of Pharaoh is the next on our list. She came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. Now this is a non-Israelite. This is the other. And yet she provides a saving role in Moses' life as well. And can we trust people that may be different from us, that may not share all of our beliefs or our perspectives, and yet have that same mother heart that can see a need, recognize someone in peril, and meet those needs. She's looking past differences. I mean, think about it this way. The, the token of the covenant for a Hebrew seed of Abraham is circumcision on the eighth day. So if Moses has been with, hidden, treasured by his parents for three months, then he's already been circumcised. He shows, he bears the mark of that covenant. And so it will be almost instantaneous that Pharaoh, excuse me, Pharaoh's daughter, would recognize this is not an Egyptian child. Of course, it wouldn't even take circumcision for that. What kind of Egyptian mother would leave a, a baby in, in a basket in the river? Oh, this is a mother, no doubt, of the Hebrews that realizes my child will die either way. Maybe this way he'll at least have some kind of fighting chance to survive. Not only am I entrusting him to God, I'm entrusting him to the kindness and compassion of a stranger which we tend to do all the time. We have to. Well, Pharaoh's daughter was the perfect person to entrust your son to. She had a mother's heart. She looked past differences, just like we would need to look past the difference of her Egyptianness. She was the right person at the right place at the right time and, and performed her role beautifully. Verse 6, when she had opened the basket, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. Now that suggests just how hard it would have been for mother and father to keep him concealed those three months. This is not one of those uh, no crying he makes kinds of babies that we imagine Jesus being in the manger. No, as soon as the, the lid of the basket is opened, here's this weeping child. And yet, how does Pharaoh's daughter react? She had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. So there you have it. She immediately recognizes, this is not one of my kind, but it doesn't matter. This is one of my kind. There's a, that's a human being, just like I am. And instead of feeling prejudice, she only felt compassion. I can only imagine how she felt about her father's edict and its inhumanity. And so a chance for her to stand up to her own father those would have been some interesting conversations, most likely. As she chooses to go against her father's commands, she's in a position that she'll be able to get away with it. And yet it still requires courage. And as we saw, it requires compassion. She prioritizes the needs of a stranger over her own personal safety, or at least over the will of her own father that she must have assumed was misguided. Father, you, you're better than that. At least I will be better than that. And I will not allow this baby. I, I can't change my father's laws for the entire kingdom. But I can save the life of one baby boy. And she does. By the way, we saw this last week in the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 50. She's mentioned there. She is a, a, an object of prophecy. Just like, like Moses would be. Just like Joseph Smith would be in that passage. It says, a seer will I raise up to deliver my people out of the land of Egypt. There's Moses. For he shall be nursed by the king's daughter and shall be called her son. So she's remembered in advance. Uh, she's also remembered after the fact in the book of Acts, as Stephen is recounting Israelite history. And speaking of Moses, he says, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And he has this surrogate mother to thank. Someone different, but someone who looked past differences. Someone courageous, someone compassionate. 
Don't ever underestimate those so-called feminine traits. All of us, male and female, need to develop them. Well, as this entire scene unfolds, who's watching from afar off? Miriam is. And she leaps at the, at the chance to make another difference here. It's, happen it's going according to divine plan, so it seems. And so she peeks out from among the bulrushes and says to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? Another example of right time, right place, right person, and the person happening to be female. Little Miriam pipes up and says to Pharaoh's daughter, You know, unless I'm mistaken, you probably can't nurse the baby, since you haven't given birth to any children of your own recently. But you know, there are all too many, all too many women in Goshen that would give anything to nurse their child. And so nursing mothers are a dime a dozen there where I come from. Would you like me to go back and find one? I could probably do so at random. Hers won't be a random choice. And what's amazing about this is, again, Miriam's proactivity, her courage to speak up, like Pharaoh's daughter, to see a need and, and want to meet it. But to help God bring this whole miracle full circle. Because in verse 8, Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called, you better believe it, the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away, nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. Now do you see what just happened there? Here is a mother who for the last three months has probably had nothing but sleepless nights and, and high alert intensity, fight or flight, adrenaline fl rushing every moment. What am I going to do to preserve the life of my child? And then, no doubt, guided by God and reassured that God's will would be done. She commends this baby to him and floats the basket down the Nile. How long did it take to have this little conversation between... How long did it take for Pharaoh's daughter to find the, the ark? For Miriam to pipe up and say, I've got a suggestion for you. And then to come rushing back home and say, Mom, you'll never believe what happened. You get to bring baby Moses back home. He's been, he's been pardoned by none other than the, the daughter of Pharaoh himself. And she wants to raise the child as her own, which means for at least until the time he is weaned, you get to keep him. You get to raise this baby. This is Abraham's hand being stayed. This is the child being sacrificed and then returned alive. And not only, do I mean, you think that the, the sacrifice is so amazing now? If God reassured and said, it's okay, move forward. If you, Josephus was right that they were praying and, and felt guided and his best chances are with God, not with us. God said, yes, you're right, and I'll actually return him to you. This is the most literal example of cast your bread upon the waters and it will return unto you after many days that I've ever seen. And it wasn't even many days. And basically overnight, this goes from a, a sleepless mother afraid for the entire family's survival to someone who can who can nurse this baby boy there in Goshen, out in the open, without any fear of retribution, as if Pharaoh's armies walked past, she would be able to let them know that this baby is under the protection of the daughter of Pharaoh. And not only that, she gets paid for it. <laughs> Talk about an investment with a high rate of return. That's how God treats all of our sacrifices. You won't stand to lose by making this sacrifice. You will only stand to gain. And that's exactly what happened for Yocheved, this mother. My son is safe. <laughs> and I get to nurse him. I get to raise him. I imagine she, went, she weaned him as slowly as she possibly could. Uh, but when it was done, she returns her child alive to Pharaoh's daughter. That's verse 10. The child grew. She brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, though he would always remain Yocheved's son as well. 
She, Pharaoh's daughter, called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. Now that's a perfect name for this baby. In Egyptian, Moses means something like to beget a child. But in Hebrew, it means to draw out. And that's exactly what Pharaoh's daughter has done. She has drawn him out of the river. But more importantly, what would Moses do as he grew? He would draw out all of Israel out of Egypt and bring them to a promised land. Moses would live up to his name in profound ways. But before we get there, think about the story thus far and realize that this deliverer has been delivered every step of the way by the women in his life. Shifra, Pua, Yocheved, Miriam, Pharaoh's daughter. And I hope that we realize when we focus on the family, get a little more specific, and the focus in the family should be on children. The world doesn't believe that. The world seems to believe that it's all about the marriage couple and their self-fulfillment and their love for one another, rather than the manifestation of their love for one another, which is the children they bring into the world. Frankly, it scares me to see Hollywood couples that talk about, oh, it's going to be so cute, we're going to have a baby, and they don't intend to raise the child themselves most of the time. Though they'll hire that out, but it's my Instagram feed will really blow up if I have this cute little newborn in my arms. Wait a minute. Do children exist for parents? Or do parents exist for their children? We need to wrap our heads and hearts around that. Otherwise, children will, will seem more like a burden than a blessing. And relationships always partake of both. But to understand that the blessing so far outweighs the burden, that children are worth risking everything for. They're worth sacrificing all. They're worth putting your life on the line, as these women did for baby Moses. And like I said, their delivering him led to him delivering them. My wife shared a beautiful experience that our second child was born with skin that was in constant need of, of lotion. His just skin was dry and cracking and she was concerned about him. Well, meanwhile, my wife had been so busy with uh, labor and delivery and, and pregnancy and everything else that she hadn't been able to take care, as much care of herself as she needed either. And her hands always seemed to be dry and cracking as well. And she noticed just the, there was a beautiful lesson here that as she continually applied lotion to her baby, her own hands became soft through the process. And that by serving her newborn, that act of service became an act of service for self in the most selfless of ways. Soft hands we still sometimes talk about when we're sacrificing for our children, knowing that somehow those blessings will come back to us. Whether it's a soft hand or a soft heart, we're grateful for those opportunities. Well, verse 11, Moses' childhood seemed to fly by as quickly as our own children. It came to pass in those days when Moses was grown. Wait, wait, what? what? Verse 10, he's getting his name as a newborn. In verse 11, he's already grown up. Yep, that's how fast it goes, it seems. Not when you're in the thick of it. <laughs> Do you young mothers and fathers out there, I get it, okay? But looking back, those, those days do fly by in what feels like a mere verse. But here Moses is grown, and he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew, one of his brethren. Now notice this. He calls them his brethren twice. And what he's focused on here is their burdens. Now, uh, like we said before, Moses would have known he was a Hebrew. Uh, there is no denying that. And, and bearing the token of the covenant in his own skin, uh, there's no avoiding his own identity. But being aware of that and not being ashamed of that are two very different things. Evidently, he wasn't ashamed of it. Now, I've been to Luxor. Uh, it's in, further south than Cairo, and Luxor would have been the, the capital of, of Egypt in the times of Moses. The Temple of Karnak is absolutely breathtaking. 
Uh, we talked about this back in Moses chapter 1, this thought that man was nothing he never had supposed. And if you grew up in the shadows of the columns of the temple of Karnak, man's nothingness wouldn't have crossed your mind either. Man's everythingness. Uh, wow, we can pull this off. We're pretty impressive. Well, it's interesting in this verse, as he goes out, it's not the spectacle of Egypt that awes him. Rather, it's the burdens of his brethren that weigh heavy on his heart. He's not looking up at the columns. He's looking down at those who built them. And, and his heart goes out to them. He hadn't forgotten who he was or where he was from. And his days in the palace had not blinded him to the situation on the streets. I hope the same can be said of us, no matter what our circumstances might be. Well, in verse 12, he looked this way and that way. Wanted to make sure he wouldn't be seen. Either that or he wanted to see if there was anyone else around to help. Do we ever do that? We see a need, but oh, I don't want to be the one that actually meets it. And so we're kind of looking around nervously at a bunch of other people that are looking around nervously, hoping someone will actually step forward. I don't know if it was fear or hesitation, but when he saw that there was no man, either no man to help or no man to tell on him, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now here you see Moses recognizing a need and feeling called to meet that need. Wonder where he got that. Sound like Shifra and Pua? Sound like Miriam? Sound like Pharaoh's daughter? This, this is how you've been preserved, Moses. And he's wanting to pay that forward and preserve other people. But in verse 13, when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. Sounds like they've been desensitized to violence, probably by overexposure to the violence at the hands of their masters. But he said to him that did the wrong, wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? So again, he's identifying a guilty party. He's stepping in to try to make wrong things right. He is defending the, what he perceives as the innocent, standing up for someone who's being bullied. He did that yesterday when it was an Egyptian attacking a Hebrew. He's doing it today when a Hebrew is striving with another Hebrew. He's no respecter of persons. He's a respecter of the innocent. He's a, he's a respecter of the victimized. Sound like someone that is tailor-made to deliver Israel? We'll see in a moment that Moses feels totally inadequate for the call. But in some ways, God could say, Moses, this is how you're wired. You've always been this way. But sadly, verse 14, the man that Moses was correcting said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Notice what the man said. Who made you a prince over me? Who made you a judge to be able to get into our affairs? Now, I would imagine that they know who Moses is. And they know that Moses is one of them. Uh, not an Egyptian. I mean, if I were Amran and Yocheved and Miriam and Aaron, I'd be telling all the neighbors, can you believe the miracle? Especially if there's some sense that this is going to be the deliverer, if Josephus was right. Oh, I bet everybody knows he's one of us. And this is like Joseph 2.0, a Hebrew that's rising in the courts of Egypt that will be able to, to pres preserve us and deliver us. But sadly, this perpetrator who didn't even see the shared humanity of his fellow Hebrew. And that's the word Moses had used. So wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? You're both brethren. How can you do this to each other? Well, he didn't see this fellow Hebrew as his fellow, and he didn't, certainly didn't see Moses as his fellow either. Who put you above me? Who made you prince or judge? You're no better than I am. Oh, that's, you, you wonder sometimes when someone is on the outside I wonder about Matthew, for example, in the New Testament. He's one, he's a, a Jew, but he's working for the Romans. And the Jews can't stand him as a result. And I wonder if there are those, I mean, evidently there are, who look at Moses no differently and think, who put you there? I don't know if there's a, an envy, a jealousy, a pride. There's something there that, that is making Moses their enemy when he, was, he only meant to be their friend, their fellow. And then the other thing that he said, what, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? And then Moses is freaking out like, uh-oh, they know. Now, how could they have known 
there was no man. Well, I guess there was the Hebrew that Moses had saved. And probably not thinking that anything negative would come of it, he probably went around saying that I was saved. I was saved from an Egyptian by a prince of Egypt himself, but one of ours, Moses. Makes you wonder, or it makes it, makes it more sense now why Jesus would say to certain people near the beginning of his ministry, after he healed them or blessed them, see that thou tellest no man. It's not yet time for me to perform my open public ministry, and I don't want the Romans yet to know who I am. Well, now the people know. And if the Hebrews know, how long will it be before the Egyptians know as well, and my life will be in danger? Sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Verse 15, now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses, and not even his own daughter would stand in the way. If Moses has been using Pharaoh's daughter as some kind of human shield, I mean, it makes you wonder how Pharaoh has felt about him from the get-go. I meant for every Hebrew boy to be slain. Why on earth do I have one growing up in my own palace? Well, when he finds out this, this is the straw that breaks the camel's back, and he's ready to slay Moses. And again, how would Pharaoh have known? At least at the beginning, it was only Hebrews who knew about this. I mean, yes, I suppose that the Egyptian taskmasters would have realized that someone was missing, uh, perhaps went on a search for that, but would the Hebrews have ratted Moses out? Well, maybe. I mean, the type that we just met in the previous verse certainly would have. Are they so bitter about Moses' special treatment? This is the crab pulling the, the other crabs back down into the pot. Uh, so bitter about that, that we, we don't want you treated differently. Even if you are above us with the chance of lifting us up, we would rather drag you back down. And so they read him out. And what happens next? Verse 15, Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now this story has been flying by this whole chapter. I mean, just a few verses ago he was a baby, then he's now full grown, and then he's out of Egypt entirely. But where do we find him? As the page turns on this story, we find him at a well. And there's no better place to start a new chapter of life than there. Ask uh, Abraham's servant as he went to meet Rebekah. Ask Jacob as he finds Rachel. Often, again, if we're following the example, I bet marriage is probably coming up soon. And sure enough, it happens a verse from now. Verse 16, now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Now with that description, it seems like we're about to meet a girl who is tailor-made to join the family business. Someone who is used to working around wells, able to draw out the living water to give to all who thirst. Someone who feeds her father's flocks and gathers them to that source of living water. Oh yeah. Now, this is going to be a good place for Moses to find a covenant companion. Now, that does beg the question, is he marrying outside of the covenant, though? Well, we just saw that her fa the father here is the priest of Midian. We'll, we'll see his name in just a moment. But Midian, if you remember a couple weeks ago when we studied Abraham, right in the aftermath of Sarah's death, he remarries a woman named Keturah, and among their children is a son named Midian. So the Midianites would still be Abrahamic, at least that broader umbrella. Not birthright, that is uh, Isaac, not Ishmael, not Midian, but still Abrahamic covenant, okay? Uh, just like the other tribes are still house of Israel, even though they're not Joseph as birthright, right? So for Moses to marry the daughter of a priest of Midian, it's still under the Abrahamic umbrella. Speaking of which, some of you asked about Asenath with Joseph. And wait, if she's Egyptian, isn't he marrying outside of the covenant? Uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were so careful. Uh, what about Joseph with Asenath? Now, some have just said, well, it's not his fault. He's in bondage, uh, and then he's working for Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's the one that kind of sets up this marriage. Okay, so it's, it's not his fault for marrying outside the covenant? Fine. Then again... If it's the Hyksos bearing rule, and this is some, you wonder, is there some kind of Abrahamic, Abrahamic umbrella for that as well? I don't know. Uh, the fact that she is the daughter of Potiphar, who's the priest of On, hmm, is what kind of priesthood is that? Is that Egyptian? Is it some way connected to Israel? I mean, we saw Abraham go down to Egypt to teach truth. 
all that in the book of Ab- uh, in the book of Abraham. Has some of that been passed down? Again, we don't know enough about Asenath's background, uh, but we can safely assume that it, she was either part of the covenant in a broad-speaking Abrahamic umbrella, or raised in a religious family who then converts when she comes to know and understand the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, her husband. Uh, The fact that she gives birth to Ephraim and Manasseh, the birthright boys would again suggest this is not an outside the box kind of a marriage. So whether by, by birth or by conversion, Asenath is totally okay. And so is Zipporah who will soon become Moses' wife. So 17, the shepherds came and drove them, these seven daughters of, of Jethro, away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. Now that sounds a lot like Jacob with Rachel, right? But also it sounds totally true to form for Moses. I defend the defenseless. It's how I'm wired. I look for people being bullied and I stand up against their enemies to make sure that they receive the justice and the mercy they deserve. Again, can't ask for a better deliverer than that. Verse 18, when they came to Reuel, their father, again, also known as Jethro, we'll see that later, he said, how is it the year comes so soon today? Here's a dad who has an eye to efficiency. Uh, That will come in handy later as he explains the importance of delegation to his son-in-law, Moses. But daughters, how did how'd you get back so quick? Uh, we've got a big flock, lots of flocks and herds, and there's no way. Did you short circuit the system here? Did you, are you trying to get out of chores? And they said, no, Dad, believe me, some miracles happened today. Verse 19, they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. Now, they don't know Moses' true identity yet. From the outside, well, it looked like an Egyptian to us. But then 20, he said unto his daughters, Jethro did, where is he? Why is it that you have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Come on, daughters, I raised you better than that. You know the laws of hospitality. You wonder if they were so flustered uh, that, oh, this, this is a, a man and maybe he'll, he'll marry one of us that they, they forgot their manners. But dad didn't and said, come on, he provided for you. The least we can do is provide for him. So in 21, they bring, they bring him. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses Zipporah, his daughter. So there's a rapid romance for you. Zipporah means bird. And I think it's a beautiful image for this woman that is willing to to take flight wherever the Lord leads her husband, Moses. And a woman who also happens to give wings to her husband whenever he feels inadequate to fly in the direction of the missions God has laid out for him. In verse 22, she bare him a son. Again, we're flying through the narrative here. And he called his name Gershom. For he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. And so Gershom means a stranger there. Uh, Ger is a word that is used throughout the Old Testament for a stranger, someone, a foreigner, someone who comes into the land. And in all of those instances, Israel is told, you better take good care of them because you were a stranger in a strange land once also. Here's Moses feeling that as he's here in Midian, perhaps describing even how he felt back in Egypt, a a Hebrew in the Egyptian court. So son, why did I name you that? So that every time I called you to dinner, every time I thought of you, I would remember that strangers deserve to be cared for, that people that are oppressed deserve to be delivered, that the marginalized deserve to be remembered, that we're all strangers in a strange land and hospitality requires that we take care of one another. Son, I hope you never forget that. And I doubt he did. His name comes from a word meaning to drive out or to cast out. It's been translated elsewhere in scripture as dismissed or dispossessed or even divorced, expelled, driven out. Think about Adam and Eve driven out from the Garden of Eden. Think of Cain driven out from the presence of God. Think of Hagar being expelled by Sarah and only being able to trust in God that somehow her and her posterity would be delivered 
Even you and me, as we sing, Oh, my father, and that beautiful line from Eliza R. Snow that says, we recognize that I'm a stranger here. And do we feel that? Gershom's all of us. Well, verse 23, then it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed, groaned is another word for that, by reason of the bondage. And they cried and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. Now there's an important world event, the passing of Pharaoh, which means the mantle of authority will then pass to his son, the brother of the daughter of Pharaoh. Of course, we know Hollywood always has a heyday with this. Uh, whether it's the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston or Prince of Egypt or any of the other remakes that have been made of this story. But there is a new Pharaoh upon the throne of Egypt and perhaps a new day for Egypt or for Israel. Well, it's definitely going to be a new day for Israel because the chapter ends and God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel. And God had respect unto them. Look at the list of verbs. And anytime you are suffering and wondering where God is. I mean, there's Joseph Smith in Liberty Jail, right? God, where art thou? Where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? Are you even aware of what I'm going through here? And look at the verbs. He hears he remembers promises made. He looks. He has respect. Now that's an interesting one. That verb had respect means he acknowledged. He took notice. He was concerned with them. He felt sorry for them. If you actually look at the Hebrew that all of those words are translated from, it's that word that we've seen so often, yada, which means to know. To know in a visceral way. To taste, to partake of to internalize. And God is doing all of that. This is experiential on his part. This is coming down to see and to share in that fellowship of sufferings that Paul talks about. And that's exactly what God is doing here. Moses, I know in as deep a way as you can say, in terms of an intimate experiential knowledge. I know exactly what my people Israel are going through. And I remember the covenant I made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I told Abraham that I would bring the people back as soon as the iniquity of the Amorites is full. And it is. It is time for their deliverance. And you, Moses, are my deliverer. Now, chapter 3, we'll see all of that unfold. Verse 1, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb, which is also known as Sinai. Now that one verse is Moses' mission in miniature. It's, the whole thing summed up right there. Moses is called to keep the flock of God. No wonder his wife needed to be one who was used to doing similar service. He would lead the flock back to the mountain of God, which is exactly what he would do in bringing them to Sinai to receive the law of the Lord. Moses, or talk about foreshadowing, you will be the ultimate good shepherd and you'll lead my flocks out of bondage to a land that flows with milk and honey, good pasture land. Ultimately, you'll lead and lift them to the mountain of God himself. In verse two, the angel of the Lord and the Joseph Smith translation corrects that, the presence of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Now, this is the famous story of the burning bush. And I sometimes wonder why we call it the burning bush, because it's about to do a lot more amazing things than just burn. But the burning, actually, I've been to Mount Sinai. The real miracle is not that the bush was burning. It's that there was a bush at all. It's the most desolate place on earth I've ever been. Uh, it's like, whoa, there's a bush. It's like, yeah, and it's burning. But no, the fact it grew in the first place, incredible. Well, it's going to do more than just burn. But the fact it burns and isn't con consumed tells us something about this fire. It's unlike any fire Moses has ever seen. Because fire, yes, produces light and heat, but it also consumes and uses up whatever fuel it was burning. Well, this doesn't. This type 
only gives, it doesn't take. It's a gift that keeps on giving. It, this could go on burning endlessly. Well, notice verse 3, and I love what happens here. Moses says to himself, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And then the next verse, And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here am I. Now pause there for a moment. In fact, to borrow the language just repeated, turn aside to see. I don't think we do that often enough in scripture study or often enough in our spiritual lives. It's obviously something important because it's repeated twice. Moses sees it and he doesn't just go on feeding the, 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 the flock. Uh, he doesn't run back down to Jethro and say, I saw the coolest thing. It was a bush on fire, but it wasn't burning down. If he had, I picture Jethro going, oh, that's amazing. What did the bush say? And Moses probably like, what do you mean, what did the bush say? Bushes don't talk. And, then he's, and Jethro rolling his eyes like, well, they don't burn without burning down either. What was the message? What are you talking message? Like, you didn't turn aside to see? See, here's, that's the key. Moses notices something is out of the ordinary. He feels some divine heat. He notices divine light. And he stops what he's doing. He turns aside to see. Sheep, you're on your own for a bit. I've got to check this out. And when God saw that Moses had turned aside to see. So it's almost like God's hiding behind the bush. Like, I wonder what he's going to do here. This is just an attention getter. The burning bush is just God clearing the divine throat, hoping that we'll stop what we're doing and pay him full attention. It takes three times for the Nephites to do it in 3 Nephi 11, right? They hear a voice, don't understand it. Hear a voice, don't understand it. And then they turn aside to see. Focus. And they understand. I think so often in our scripture study or in our church attendance or in our temple worship or in our prayer, we'll feel something. We'll notice something. And that's enough. Like, wow, I felt something. I felt a burning in the bosom. I saw some glimmer of light. And then we miss the message because we don't turn aside to see. In our scripture study, we'll see a, a phrase or a word that seems to glow on the page almost. Something that catches our attention and we just wonder if there's something to that. Wonder if there's any nuance in the Hebrew. Or wonder if there's any other Bible translations that clarify that verse. Wonder if there's any personal application for me. If nothing else through these two years of Unshaken, I pray you have noticed what comes when we turn aside to see. We do it often. That's why these videos are so long. But when there are places in Scripture that just seem to, to call our, our attention, I just want to give God that time and allow the Spirit to teach me more than just a glowing word from God. Again, same with church, same with prayer, same with temple attendance. When something, when you feel the burning in your bosom, Stop what you're doing. If you think about Lehi and what he does in 1 Nephi chapter 1, it's such a brilliant example of this, that he hears a word from God through his prophets and he stops and he begins praying. And then God's seeing that prayer. Oh, well, I can teach you more. And he does. And then, and then Lehi does something with that and God gives him more. And he does something with that and God gives him more. And it's this beautiful tag team experience of learning from the Lord because Lehi is constantly turning aside to see. Uh, Joseph Smith does the same thing as a 17-year-old kid when the angel Moroni appears. And after he leaves his, with his message delivered, Joseph doesn't turn over in bed and go back to sleep. It says in Joseph Smith history that he marvels and meditates and muses. And that's all Moroni needs. I picture him like hovering outside the window, uh, turning off the internal glow, just to, what's he doing in there? And when he sees that Joseph is turning aside to see and marveling, meditating, musing on the message he just delivered. Then Moroni is like, sweet, I'm coming back for round two. Uh, the student has not yet rung the bell to end the lesson. And if the student can keep going, you better believe the teacher can. 
And so here comes the message from God, the message from Moroni, the message to Lehi, the message to any one of us. Don't underestimate the power of what can be forthcoming once you turn aside to see. Burning bush, no big deal. Speaking bush, oh, that I want to take some notes about. So verse 5, God says, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. This is a God who wants to come down to us, but also oh, wants to maintain some respectful distance. Here we are proving the contrary of the infinite and the intimate. I have come down to speak with you. I've come down to hear and experience, to yada, to know fully what my people are experiencing in their bondage. But I remain above them so that they can know how to climb back to my presence. So draw not nigh hither and take your shoes off because the ground that you're on is holy. Actually, Brigham Young once said that if you are holy, then everywhere you walk will end up becoming holy ground. Well, God's been there. It's holy. Moses is there, and Moses is meant to be as holy as God intends for him to become. So no shoes. There's something about being barefoot. Like I said last week, I always take my shoes off before I film these lessons. I know I'm on holy ground with you and with the scriptures. But there's also something about being reminded with God being so close and the imminence threatening to overcome the transcendence, right? The intimate uh, overshadowing the infinite. Well, it's times like that that we might need to be reminded that our divinity is also mingled with dust. Remember, God brings Moses up to this exceeding high mountain in Moses chapter 1. That's actually the second time it happens. What we're seeing today is the first. But then it was that admission. Man is nothing? Ah, it doesn't cross my mind often enough. Well, it needs to. So Moses, take your shoes off so that your dust is back in contact with the dust of the earth. My mother-in-law is amazing when it comes to mindfulness and meditation. And she often talks about being fully grounded. That when you are trying to ground your, your thoughts and your feelings, your, to ground your mind and keep it from wandering every which way. That's a helpful thing to do when you're trying to turn aside to see, by the way. But it requires grounding and to sit and to feel your body and it's your feet, uh, the pressure of your feet against the floor. There's something profound in this. And again, I just picture taking off his sandals and putting dusty feet on dusty earth and dust thou art and to dust thou shalt return. And do you understand who you are, this mixture of dust and divinity? Do you understand who I am, this mixture of the infinite and the intimate? Moses, are you coming to know me in the way I have fully come to know you? and fully come to know the experience of your people back in Egypt. I want you to bring them back here and raise their dust into divinity with my help. Holy ground, we're going to make the ground holy wherever you and I go. So come with, walk with me, as he said to Enoch. Well, he keeps speaking to Moses and says in verse 6, I am the God of thy father. Wait, the God of Amram? He's a no-namer. You know him too? Yes. I'm also the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, those names that everyone knows. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. There is this overwhelming sense of inadequacy on his part, just like Enoch felt, just like any of us would feel. My dust in the presence of his divinity? How do I even look? Well, verse 7, the Lord continues to explain. I have surely seen the afflictions of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Again, those verbs. Seen? I'm not blind to their burdens. Heard? I hear every anguished cry. I know. Yada. I feel. I partake. I experience their sorrows. True condescension, true compassion, true empathy. God feels it all. And thus, verse 8, I am come down to deliver them. 
out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large land unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Yes, I know all of them as well. They're all my children and I am concerned about their growing wickedness, just as I'm concerned about the growing anguish of my people Israel. As I said, there is condescension, but it's for the purpose of con-ascension. Is that even a word yet? Let's coin it, shall we? I have come down so that I can raise you up. And that's exactly what Jesus does. He came down to be with us and like us so he could then raise us back to God so we could be with him and like him through Christ. I love how he says it. I'm going to do this, Moses. I just need a little help. I need some human hands through which to work. But I'll be the one doing that work. In verse 9, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. So not only have I heard the victim, but I've also confirmed the acts of the perpetrator. We saw that back with Sodom and Gomorrah, right? I, I've heard the cry, uh, and, the, and I want to see the sin. I need to come down to, to confirm that. Even omniscience is not going to jump to conclusions. I've heard their cry, and yes, I've seen the sin of their oppressors. It is time to intervene and offer justice to those who are suffering. So verse 10, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. You see how God still claims them? Probably wondering, will they still claim me? We're going to have to see about that too, Moses. But they are my people. So come now, so I can send you. There's something beautiful there. In the New Testament, when it speaks of Jesus gathering his disciples and from them sending out his apostles. A disciple is someone who comes to follow. A, an apostle is someone who is sent to lead. And here we see that with Moses. You come so that then I can send you. If you ever intend to be sent by God on any kind of mission, you need to come unto him first. Now, this is where we see Moses and all of his inadequacy unfold. And like I said, we saw the same thing with Enoch. Remember Enoch? I'm just a lad. I don't have the experience. Uh, all the, uh, I'm slow of speech, so I lack the, the qualifications, the gifts. All the people hate me, so I don't have much of a horizontal relationship. And why would you call me? So I'm not even sure about our, my vertical relationship. Now, Moses is going to feel all of that and then some. So if you think that Enoch struggled with his sense of self, uh, Moses has it even worse. And so what we're going to see unfold in the next, this, the end of this chapter and the beginning of the next, is these rounds of reassurance uh, where Moses will, will offer an excuse, if you want to call it that, or at least just admit an inadequacy. Maybe we can put it that way. Uh, he, he raises a concern and then God reassures him only for Moses to raise another concern, and God reassures him. And again, these rounds of reassurance that it's going to be okay. Well, here's round one. Verse 11, Moses says to God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Do you notice his pronouns? I. I can't do it. Who am I? How on earth can I accomplish this mission? And how does the Lord respond? Verse 12, he said, Certainly, I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the children out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Now, the end of that is interesting. It's like you're standing right here. Well, you'll leave. I promise you will we'll come right back. And I will, I will show you the end from the beginning. I'll be back, and so will you, and so will all of gathered Israel. This will be a successful mission. Trust me. But what does he say at the beginning? He borrows Moses' pronoun. As Moses is like, I? Why me? And, and God is like, okay, it's not you. It's me. I'm the one that will do the delivering. I just need some human hands with which to work. Will you, are you willing to at least be an instrument in my hands so that I can perform this work? Well, I don't know. Excuse number two rises in verse 13. 
Moses says to God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? So here's his second concern. I won't know how to answer their questions. I won't know how to resolve their concerns. Maybe this is part of that vertical concern that Enoch had. Why me? When I, how have I found grace in thy sight? And here's Moses. I don't know you well enough to introduce you to others. I think every missionary feels that. Is my testimony strong enough? Is my faith deep enough? Is my relationship real enough that I can actually introduce other people to God? Do I know him that well? And so here's Moses asking the same thing. What will I say? What is your name? Well, reassurance for round two, verse 14. God says to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Now the Lord is addressing both the general and the specific there. More generally, you're worried about what to say, well, open your mouth and it will be filled. I'll tell you what to say, just as he did here. But more specifically, the name of God, how will you introduce me to the people of Israel? Well, how's this for a name? I am that I am. Now, I picture Moses still scratching his head going, I, I'm still confused with this. What's your name? I am. I know that. Yep, and that's how you'll introduce me. Help people understand that I exist, that I'm here, that I'm real, that I know, yada, all of their concerns, their burdens, their afflictions, I've seen, I've heard, I have felt. I have come down to be one of you so that I can lift you up to become one like me. Moses, I am... And some, this is the verb to be. And maybe that's an even better way to say it. It's not just, it, it's I'm the self-existent one. Moses, I, you really want to worry about names? Just understand that I exist, that I'm here, that I'm real. And not only that I am, but that I call into being. I spake and order came out of chaos. I said, let there be light, and there was light, and it was good. I will speak the house of Israel into existence by making a covenant and calling Abraham by name and introducing myself to him and to Isaac and to Jacob and to Joseph and now to you, Moses, my deliverer. I cause to be and I will cause you to be my mouthpiece. I will cause Israel to be my people if they will only have me to be their God. It's amazing when Jesus is speaking and says that Abraham rejoiced to see his day and everyone is looking at him in disbelief going, <laughs> you're not even 40 years old yet. And Abraham lived hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. How could he have possibly seen your day? And then when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, he's just invoked that same name, that same title. I exist. I'm here. I was there for Abraham. I'm there for Moses. I'm here for you and will forever be. There's something profound, something beyond. I still can't completely wrap my head around it, but my heart gets closer when I realize that coming to know God is not a matter of simple explanation. It's not even a matter of secondhand introduction, since that's what Moses was worried about. How do I introduce you to them? What name do I call you by? No, it's not explanation. It's not introduction. It's firsthand experience. It's coming to know God as he is. And one of the best ways to do that is coming to know God by seeing how he's causing us to be. What is he calling into existence as he reaches down to me? As I take my shoes off and it's dust to dust and infinite becomes intimate and he says to come so I can be sent. 
as he comes down with me so we can go back up to him together? Am I coming to see him for who he is, that he is? And am I coming to become like him? This is a place I can't really explain. And maybe that's what it's meant to be. If Moses is scratching his head and if we're scratching our heads, maybe it's because it's supposed to be first-hand experience, like I just said. Maybe this is a, a burning bush verse that I can't turn you aside to see, but I can do it on my own. And something visceral, something experiential can well up within me as I come to know a God who is. I've read most of the philosophical defenses for the existence of God, and I've read most of the skeptical responses to those defenses. And both have left me with a desire to remain barefoot by the burning bush and have an experience with God. That's the only thing that's really irrefutable. That's the good news. It can't be passed on as proof. I guess that's the bad news. But since when was God confined to proof texts and philosophical arguments when we are meant to be bound up in him? And this is life eternal, that they might know the, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Not eternal life because they know the philosophical arguments for the existence of God. It's more than Pascal's wager. It's more than the argument from design. It's, I would call it the argument from experience, but it's not, a, not an argument. It's an opportunity to live into that, to breathe into that, to, to take your shoes off and to be caught up in God, to experience the transcendent as you feel it become the imminent and feel your dust rise into divinity within. I can invite you to have an experience and nothing more. He is and he causes to be. And so may you come to know him as that Great I am. Moses is getting it. Help the people of Israel have a similar experience. And you'll know it's happened when you are back with me on this mountain because you're not supposed to come back alone. I want the people to be on this mountain together so that they will come to experience me the way you are now experiencing me. That's DNC 84, that Moses sought diligently to sanctify the people that they might behold the face of God We'll see that in a couple of weeks as he's trying desperately to get the whole house of Israel to ascend Sinai with him. There's a bush there you have to listen to more than see, more than it, it's burning. You'll feel it. You'll see it. You'll experience it. Fire is not something you just talk to. It's something you're warmed by. And prayer is meant to be that sometimes, most of the time. Not me just writing my, to, or uttering my to-do list or my wish list. But prayer like a burning bush, sitting in its presence and feeling warmed within. Then real experience that can come. And a God who exists and calls all things into being can call out of me a better being than I could possibly imagine. I... I I hope this is making sense. Uh, it'll happen on this mountain, Moses, if you can get them here. Only then will they truly come to know me as you are coming to know me. Well, that's still insufficient for Moses. I don't, I don't completely understand. Moses, uh, then God continues to explain it. There's a lot in this second round of reassurance. God continues in verse 15. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. So if I am that I am is too confusing, then introduce me by way of relationships, since that's the kind of God I am. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do you still feel connected to them? I do. 
And if you're connected to them, then you can be connected to me. I'm the God of your fathers, all of them, down to the latest generation. I know Amram, I know Yocheved, I know your fathers and the fathers, and I'm trying to bring you all into a remembered relationship with me. That will be my memorial unto you. A God of relationships, a God of covenants, a God of remembering. Verse 16, go and gather the elders of Israel together. So you're not going to do this all alone. There needs to be buy-in from the people you're going to lead. And they have their own elders of Israel. Despite the fact that they're all there in bondage, there are still leaders among the flock. And they can be your under-shepherds. So gather the elders of Israel. And say unto them, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. How's that for a promise of the promised land? Flowing with milk? Oh, there's sustenance. And wherever there is milk, there is meat as well. Where is that milk coming from? From a source that is higher than itself. So it will flow with milk and grow into it. Milk is what is given to babes in arms. And I am trying to nurse Israel into its true identity. And so as you come into this promised land, that's where we'll start. We'll, We'll start with milk. But it will be the source of all the sustenance you, need, sustenance you need for now. And honey, oh, that will provide the sweetness of the experience. Uh, it's not just milk and meat alone, but honey. And if there's honey, there must be flour and fruit and vegetation. The, the evidence of the kind of paradise I'm, I'm offering you in this promised land. Oh, milk and honey are just the foretaste, the preview of all that's coming beyond. And then verse 18, this promise. And they, the people of Israel, the elders of Israel, shall hearken to thy voice. They'll believe you, Moses, trust me. Thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. And now let us go, we beseech thee. Three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And we'll see that again because I always thought, well, Joe, let my people go because we're headed to the promised land. That is the ultimate goal, right? A land flowing with milk and honey. The land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as promised by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Here, I'm just asking for a three-day journey into the wilderness. I wonder if this is just the beginning of a test for Pharaoh. Will you at least honor our humanity, our autonomy, our religious desires, enough to go three days into the wilderness and offer sacrifice and then come back? Again, the promise ultimately still stands, promised land, full freedom. But can you at least honor a few steps in that direction? If not, then fine. We will escalate our demands and go straight to that promised land with no hopes of returning after three days of sacrifice. Well, what happens next? God lets Moses know in advance what Pharaoh's response will be. In 18, he said, the people, your people, will hearken to your voice. But 19, I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. Well, good thing a mighty hand is exactly what God has. And if Pharaoh is unwilling to listen to a still small voice or a mere messenger, then a mighty hand will have to come down on him and he will feel the weight of a heavy hand pointing him in the direction he must go. Sure enough, verse 20, I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. Now, that word wonders there is the same word that he used with Sarah, asking, is anything too hard for the Lord? Moses, is anything too hard for me now? If I can bring life out of a dead womb for Sarah, then surely I can bring slaves out of Egypt. 
And in fact, I can bring beauty out of the ashes. In fact, I don't even see ashes. The bush burned and wasn't consumed, which means it leaves no ash behind. I will take the experiences you've had and sanctify them. I will take what you've been through, and I don't even consider it ash. I don't consider it burned down dream. I consider it a preparatory state. I consider it a mortal experience of coming to know me, and that is a beautiful experience, no matter how hard the certain days might be. Let Pharaoh believe or not believe, but you, Moses, please believe me and trust. My wonders will be forthcoming. In verse 21, then, God says, I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, even if you can't quite have favor in Pharaoh's sight to start. It shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty, but every woman shall borrow. Better translation is ask, because they're not going to return what they're borrowing here. This is not a rental. This is asking. Every woman shall ask of her neighbor and of her that sojourneth in her house jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the golden calf episode in a couple of weeks. But here there is this promised role reversal. The Egyptians have, they didn't borrow and they certainly didn't ask. They just demanded and ordered and brought you into bondage and gave you nothing to show for it. Well, it's time to pay the piper. And so as you leave, again, I'm, I'm laying it out the end from the beginning. I promise you'll find your way but right back here. And you will have turned slaves into citizens of the kingdom of God. You will take people with nothing and they will come with jewels of gold and of silver. You'll take those who have been stripped of their coats of many colors and they will be wearing Egyptian raiment. Oh, sons and daughters of the king of kings. Me. And I will provide for them. Egypt will finally pay for the years of servitude. But even all of those promises aren't yet enough to fully reassure Moses. And so we turn the page to the next chapter, but the story just picks up where it left off. Excuse or concern or challenge number three. Chapter four, verse one, Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. Now, this is one of my favorite rounds of reassurance because the irony as chapter four begins with, they won't hearken to me. What did God say to Moses very plainly in the middle of reassurance number two? And they will hearken to thy voice. <laughs> so to me, it's, I, I picture God going, Moses, seriously, come on. I just told you they're going to believe you. And your next question is, but what if they don't believe me? I'm starting to worry or I'm starting to wonder, who's the one with the problem with believing? They will hearken to your voice. Are you hearkening to mine? They will believe you. Do you believe me? Okay, but I'll play this game, Moses. Okay. Assuming I'm wrong and somehow they won't believe you, here's a few things you can show them by way of wonders. Okay, by way of proof that nothing's too hard for me. So, verse 3 the Lord says to him, what is that in thy hand? And Moses said, a rod. And God said, well, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And I would too. A snake at your feet. I'd jump back in fear. And then God says, okay, Moses, go pick it up. In fact, he says in verse four, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail very specific there. And Moses put forth his hand, probably trembling, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. <sighs> okay. <sighs> All is well. What's up with the tail? I'm not uh, the crocodile hunter. I've, I've never caught snakes like this, but I would assume the scary part of the snake is the head. And so if I'm going to pick it up by anything, I want to pick it up by the neck, right behind the head, because then I've got the scary part under control. If I pick it up by the tail, can't it twist around and bite me? If it's hanging, can't it strike my foot? Uh, I, 
You're asking me to do the scariest imaginable thing, God. Uh huh. It's exactly what I'm doing. Trust me. And when he takes the snake, it turns back into the stick it was to begin with. Yeah, show Israel that. That'll be an interesting wonder. Well, still wondering yourself, Moses, if you can do it? Well, how about this for sign or wonder number two? Verse five, all that was that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. But if you need more, then verse six, the Lord said furthermore unto him, put now thine hand into thy bosom. So kind of put your hand to your chest inside your robes. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, the hand was leprous as snow. Now, that's an odd description, but leprosy is such a loathsome disease. We'll see this more with Miriam. We'll see it more in the book of Leviticus. Uh, we say it in the New Testament all the time, right? Where, where they're walking around crying out, unclean, unclean, because the fear of contagion was real. Well, if I pull, put my hand in my chest and then put, pull it out and it's leprous as snow, whatever that means, and if leprosy is such a loathsome disease that the skin is, is deteriorating to the point that, I don't know, is that where the snow analogy comes in, that pieces of skin are flaking off and falling to the ground? I, I don't know. Leprosy is scary. And so if I had a leprous hand, what would I do with it? I would keep it as far away from me as possible. Right? Again, that's why lepers in Israel were kept outside the camp. Uh, scatter. Stay away. I'm contagious. I'm unclean. Well, here's my hand. I'm ready to cut this thing off and cast it from me. I don't want it to contaminate the rest of myself. Which makes the next verse so fascinating. The Lord then says, put thine hand into thy bosom again. Wait, wait, what? There's no way. I've got to keep this as far away as possible. You want me to stick it back into my, my robe and back onto my, my bare chest? Are you kidding? But he does. He put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. Now, other translations simply say he drew it, it out. But I love the King James word, pluck, because it suggests just how afraid he probably was. That he sticks it in tremblingly and then <gasps> plucks it out as quick as possible and just, I hope I didn't spread anything. And the verse ends. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And then again, verse 8, it shall come to pass if they will not believe thee, since that's what you're worried about. Neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, though I told you they'd hearken even without it. Then they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land. And the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. And with that, oh, you see a foreshadowing of the first plague of Egypt on a much grander scale, not just pull out some water and drop it on the earth in its blood, but we're going to turn the whole river into blood. How's that for shock and awe? How's that for a wonder? Nothing too hard for me. But again, that will be for Pharaoh, because I already told you, Pharaoh won't hearken to your voice. But as I said, the people will. I mean, use these signs and wonders if you choose. But I, it's not them I'm worried about, Moses. It's you. What I love most about this round of reassurance is what it's saying to Moses. Moses, you're the one scared of Pharaoh. You're the one concerned about going back to Pharaoh's court. You see, you think Pharaoh is a serpent that will sink its fangs into you and, and leave you lifeless. Do you trust me, Moses? Will you have the faith to reach out your hand and take him by the tail? Leave his fangs fully exposed and guess what? Do it. Trust me. Have faith and he will turn into the stick that he's always been. Pharaoh is a stick, not a snake. He will not harm you. I know I'm asking you to go into Pharaoh's court. Expose yourself to that kind of danger. I promise you will come out fine. There's nothing to fear here, Moses. Trust me. I am so moved by these reassurances. And therefore, Moses, he needs them. 
If you need them, then God will give you reassurances as well. In some way, he will manifest his wonders to you so that serpents reappear as snakes and entering Pharaoh's court isn't quite so scary after all. Moses needs to know that. Well, he still doesn't completely understand or get it. It's not sinking in the way it should. And so concern slash challenge slash excuse number four comes in verse 10. Moses says to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Exactly what Enoch had said. I lack the ability. Interesting how he said it. I'm not eloquent enough. I guess he lacks the articulateness that President Kimball had mentioned for women. But even I'm not eloquent, I haven't been before, and I'm still not now. It's almost like he pictured, well, you're speaking to me. So now, of course, just touch my tongue and loose it, and I'll be, I'll be Elder Maxwell 2.0. I'll be Isaiah. I'll be Shakespeare. I'll be eloquent. But that still hasn't happened. Here I am still kind of tripping over my tongue. Well, first of all, did you think that, strength, that weaknesses turned into strengths instantaneously? That's typically not the way it works, although it can. Instead, what does God say by way of reassurance? I love this one too. Verse 11 and 12. The Lord says to him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who make it the dumb or deaf or the seen or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. Now the end there is beautiful. I'll, just open your mouth, I'll fill it. Okay, I will let you know what to say. But he'd already said that before, right? Uh, he'd already filled in some blanks as far as the name of God and how to introduce him and so forth. So I'm more interested in the first part. Who made man's mouth? Now, I used to read that as if God were saying, Moses, I make mouths for a living. So good news. Yours is a little faulty. Uh, it, it's past the warranty, needs a little upgrade. I don't know. Uh, sorry, I didn't realize that. Uh, I mean, from up here, you guys all look the same uh, down below. And so I, I, I guess I should have called Aaron um, since he's eloquent. We'll see him in a moment. But since I've, since I've got you on the line, I might as well stick with who I chose to begin with. And don't worry, I, who made your mouth? Well, I can remake it because I make mouths for a living. That's not exactly how I read it anymore. Yes, God will bless Moses to become a little less uh, slow of speech than he was. It's like Tevye, right? For someone slow of speech, Moses spoke a lot, right? And he will, but he still lacks the eloquence of an Isaiah. He lacks the profundity of a Paul, perhaps you could say. But this is, what, this is what I love about the way the Lord is setting this up. When he says, who made man's mouth, and then goes on and says, who makes the dumb or the deaf or the seen or the blind? Notice he didn't say the ones with perfect pitch and the ones with, with, with eagle eye 2020 vision. No, he speaks of those who lack those things, the dumb, the deaf, the blind. As if he were saying to Moses, who made your mouth that way? It's less a matter of, oh, I made it, I can make a better mouth. No, I, who gave you that weakness? Yes, I can give you a strength in its place. And maybe I will, maybe I won't. But who gave you that weakness to begin with? A weakness that hopefully has given you humility so that you will turn unto me. That's Ether 12.27 for you, right? God gives unto us weakness that we may be humble. And if we're humble and we turn unto him, then he can make weak things strong. But the weakness was as much a gift as the strength was. The, the sickness was just as important as the cure. And maybe it's not a sickness after all. Maybe it's not a weakness. Maybe it's an attempt on God's part to introduce himself to us in a way that will convince us that we need him instead of convince us that we don't. I, 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 there's something profound about That's another passage worth turning aside to see. Well, verse 13 then is excuse or concern number five. 
He's still not getting it. Moses says, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Which in the King James Version seems like, okay, fine, then if you picked me, then you picked me and just go ahead. But in other translations, it's more clear. Moses is begging one last time, please send someone else. Okay, send whom thou wilt send. And it's not me. Okay, I'm sticking with what I said at the very beginning. Why would you choose me? Now, by now, we've gone through five excuses and we're on our fifth round of reassurance. Moses, seriously, you still don't get it? You still don't trust that I'm the one that will do it. It just happens to be through you. That was round number one. You still don't trust that I will fill your mouth. I will introduce myself to you so that you can introduce me to them with my very own name. You still don't trust the, that a serpent's just a stick and that you'll go in and out of Pharaoh's court unscathed. You still don't trust that I gave you a mouth like that for a reason. Well, now I'm a bit righteously indignant. How's that for a, a calm way to describe it? You still don't understand it. So in verse 14, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. The bush is burning a little brighter with a little added kindling. God says, fine. Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. I gave him that gift just like I gave you that weakness. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. Look ye there. When he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And in fact, I know you'll be glad in your heart too. God goes on, verse 15, Thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth, just like I promised earlier, and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. So even Aaron will still need my help. He shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. This is like Joseph Smith as Moses, to Oliver Cowdery as Aaron, or as Sidney Rigdon as Aaron. But Moses, I'll provide. It's amazing to me that even in his anger, his righteous indignation, God is merciful. He continues to reassure. He, I'm not letting you off the hook, Moses. There's something you need to learn about yourself. In, in so many ways, you were, you were raised up to be this very deliverer. I, I told Joseph in Egypt about you for crying out loud. Please live up to it, divine expectations. You have been foreordained for this very purpose. But Aaron was too. And I will bring him along in order to bring you along. So, verse 17, he also adds, Thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. Now, it's a rod. I, I can't think of a better analogy for a crutch. Something to, to lean on, Moses, since you seem so desperately in need of one. That's what those signs and wonders were for. It's what Aaron's help will be. That's what the plagues of Egypt will end up being for, for Pharaoh, as well as for you and the people. I just want you to come to know me. So use this rod as well. It will help you along. And then finally, verse 18, Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said unto him, Let me go, I pray thee, and return unto my brethren which are in Egypt, and see whether they be yet alive. And I actually think the brethren he's referring to are the Egyptians, not the Israelites. He knows the Israelites will still be there in bondage. God's told him that. But I think he's still worried about it. But if it's the same Egyptian brethren, the same ones that wanted to kill me, the same Pharaoh that, sent, that, that I fled from, then uh, let me go down and at least kind of poke around the corner and see if it's the same people that are out to get me. Again, this sense of inadequacy on Moses' part is absolutely overwhelming. But he asks Jethro, please let me go. And Jethro says to Moses, go in peace. Compare that to Jacob's father-in-law, Laban, right? He couldn't even ask. He's never going to let us go. He's just going to change my wages again. So Leah, Rachel, you ready to go? Let's go. Well, verse 19, the Lord says to Moses in Midian, Go, return unto Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought thy life. So there's the reassurance that Moses so desperately needed. That's exactly what he was asking for. 
in some ways, this is like the young Jesus who's gone down to Egypt to escape the slaughter of the innocents in Bethlehem. And by the time he comes back, it's because Herod, who had sought to slay him, is now gone. Similar parallels here. Then verse 20, Moses took his wife, Zipporah, and his sons and set them upon an ass and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. In fact, it seems like he's got more crutches than one. He brings Zipporah, he brings his sons. Now it said sons plural, we met Gershom, the stranger in a strange land. Moses also has a second son named Eliezer, which means God is my help. Ezer is that same help meet that, that Eve was meant to be for Adam, an enabling power. And for Moses, who needs all the help he can get, his second son is God, my God, Eli, Ezer, my God is my help. He's the help that I need. But I love that he also brings that help, personified, Eliezer. He brings stranger in a strange land, and I'm going back to it, uh, Gershom, and he brings his help meet, Zipporah, with him. Now, we'll see a little later that he, we, actually, we don't see it in Scripture. It's, it's interesting. He sends Zipporah and the boys back home to Jethro, to be, well, probably to be safe. And when he realizes, wait a minute, if I was scared to death to go into Pharaoh's court myself, what, what on earth am I bringing my wife and, and baby boys for? Uh, honey, I, I'm sorry I, I brought you this far. I'm kind of freaked out, okay? If you haven't sensed my, my sense of inadequacy. Uh, but go home. Because when we get to Exodus 18, Jethro will come and meet uh, Moses on the way to Sinai, and he brings Zipporah and the boys with him. So she and they have come back home to Jethro at some point in the narrative. My guess is they leave once, once Aaron comes. It's like he's traded out his helpmeets, <laughs> right? Uh, but, I, but I love the thought. I'm bringing Eliezer, my God is my help. I'm bringing Zipporah, my helpmeet. I just need that kind of support. I want, I want my wife with me. And that to me says something again about Moses and his sense of inadequacy, but also something about Zipporah and the kind of help meet she is. We'll see it dramatized really dramatically in, in the end of this chapter. But pick up the story in verse 21. The Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand. But I will harden his heart that he shall not let the people go. Now, there's a head-scratching verse for you. Is God I mean, not just toying with people's emotions? Is he toying with their agency? Is he messing with their will? Because that verse sure suggests that he is. Um, I'm trying to, you know, ramp up the, the drama here, Moses. I mean, if this is ever going to be Hollywood material, then we're going to need some plagues and things, right? Uh, and so, yeah, you'll ask him to, to let the people go, but then I, I won't let him do it yet. Oh, that'll be great. Yeah, that, that's... This sounds like a script writer or a screenwriter. He'll say no, uh, and then you'll have to try again. He'll say no, and you try again, and we'll just keep ramping it up, as, however long we need to, uh, to, to make this Hollywood material. Well, thankfully, there is a Joseph Smith translation that corrects that verse. It says, yes, do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I put in thine hand. But here's the clarification. And I will prosper thee. But Pharaoh will harden his heart, and he will not let the people go. That is an essential correction. Because left alone, it suggests more than a foreordination on, on God's part with Moses, but a kind of predestination of God on Pharaoh's part, as far as his own heart hardness. And uh, it's one thing when people say, oh, well, the devil made me do it. It's even worse to say, oh, well, God made me do it. Really? Now we're laying our sins at the feet of God, not seeking forgiveness, but e extending blame. Well, I only did this because you made me this way. And I have no control over my own propensities. No, that is an abdication of agency that was never intended. We are meant to offer God our agency. Again, a gift he'll never actually accept. He'll say, oh, thank you. I'm, I'm really touched. Keep it so you have something to give me tomorrow. Okay? I want you to actually continually exercise your agency and have a will to give. But learn obedience in the process. No, it's not, some, it's not a one-time gift and we're just done and now we're 
puppets in the hands of God. But neither were we puppets to begin with, as if God is forcing us against our will to be something we weren't intended to be. No. Pharaoh will choose to harden his heart. He will lean into the natural man. He will reject the word of God. And that's his choice and his accountability. There will be a price to pay for that. God then goes on in verse 22, Thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Now there's some poetic justice there. I'm treating Israel as my firstborn son, and I value him. I want to see him live to his full potential, fill the measure of his creation. And that requires freedom, autonomy. Well, I know you want the same thing for your son. In fact, you want your son to grow up to become your successor. Well, I want my sons and daughters to grow up to become like their heavenly parents too. Kings and queens, priests and priestesses all. But I guess we'll have to choose. Which firstborn will be honored? If you'll honor mine, then I'll honor yours. If you will allow my firstborn to go free, then I'll allow your firstborn to grow up and fulfill his role in Egypt. But if you refuse to feel with someone, then I will force you to feel like that person. If you won't mourn with those that mourn, then you'll mourn on your own by going through the things that they've gone through. And so, treat my firstborn as if they are nothing, in fact, eat worse than nothing. Slay my firstborn and I will slay yours. And you'll know exactly what it feels like. We'll know this next week that the final plague, the one that breaks Pharaoh, ultimately, is the death of the firstborn. And it's interesting that right here, he is told the end from the beginning. Like Moses was. We'll end up right back here on this mountain. Pharaoh, this is about firstborn versus firstborn. Honor mine, I'll honor yours. If not then you're, you will pay for your mistreatment of my firstborn with the loss of your own. Verse 24 then is where it gets weird. And this is where Zipporah steps in to be the help meet that Moses needed. It came to pass by the way in the inn that the Lord met him, Moses, and sought to kill him. Wait, what? Now there's a Joseph Smith translation of this that's going to help. It explains, it came to pass that the Lord appeared unto him as he was in the way, by the inn. The Lord was angry with Moses, and his hand was about to fall upon Moses to kill him. And here's the explanation. For he had not circumcised his son. Now this verse is really surprising because it seems like, whoa, what, what, what is happening just now? We just went from talking about slaying Pharaoh's firstborn out of his obstinance or wickedness, and... And now we're talking about slaying Moses himself? Wait a minute, I thought Moses was the deliverer. He's he looking like he needs some deliverance himself. Well, yes, and like always, it'll be a woman to step in to deliver him. We'll see that in just a second. But it all boils down to this lack of circumcising his son. Now, earlier it said sons, plural, and so we're assuming that it's both Gershom and Eliezer present. Right? This story seems just to revolve around Gershom. So it's confusing. There's a whole history of like rabbinic commentary on this and how's this working and it was one circumcised, one was the other not. I'm going to avoid all that because we don't know any of it for sure. But we do know that in Gershom's case, he is uncircumcised and God is about to slay Moses for that oversight. Now, Genesis 17, when circumcision was first introduced to Father Abraham as a token of the covenant, he was warned, the uncircumcised man-child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. To that we might add Doctrine and Covenant section 68, verse 25, that says that parents in Zion that do not teach their children to understand faith in Christ and repentance of sin and baptism by immersion and the gift of the Holy Ghost, those first principles and ordinances of the gospel, those rungs on Jacob's ladder, that, that these are the steps in the covenant. Any parent who doesn't do that before the child becomes accountable, then the child remains unaccountable and the parent is accountable for the child's sins. Oh, yikes. 
uh, that's a scary thought. So parents, you better be intentional in your parenting. You better make sure that you are passing down the covenant as best as you can. Yes, the child's agency is involved, so I, I get that. But during their unaccountable years especially, make sure that you're preparing them for the covenant. Well, for whatever reason, Moses had not done that for Gershom, and he remained uncircumcised. Now, like we said, it was supposed to happen the eighth day as a, a symbol of the eighth year becoming accountable before God. And that hadn't happened. It makes me wonder why. Now, again, there's rabbinic commentary that speaks of, and, and some scholars that have weighed in saying, well, there, were, there was circumcision in surrounding cultures, not just Israel's. And perhaps they did it a different way. Maybe the Midianite form of circumcision happened at a later date. There's some suggestion that circumcision happened right before marriage uh, to prepare that, that person to then, you know, to be circumcised, to heal from, the, from the, the surgery, and then step into a marriage having, well, having shed blood. Just as a woman, as she approaches marriage age, begins shedding blood as well. And some kind of blood covenant, as they enter a marriage covenant. I mean, it's, just, it's really interesting, all of these, these symbols and, and marriage and, and blood as a, as a token of covenant. And, and then those two, the two flesh becoming one, two blood becoming one blood, offspring, uh, procreation circumcision and how it relates to that. I mean, it's fascinating, right? Just like we saw the rainbow as a token of the covenant is inherently connected to rain and circumcision as a token of the covenant is inherently connected to procreation. Uh, it, again, fascinating parallels here. But what's happening here, why didn't Moses circumcise Gershom already? Uh, absent Jewish tradition and and possibilities of Midianite circumcision being different. I wonder if part of it was he spent his formative years in Egypt as the odd man out. He, in some ways, was more Egyptian than Hebrew, although he recognized the Hebrews as his brethren and was concerned about their burdens. But you remember the first time Zipporah and her sisters saw him? Oh, it's an Egyptian, Dad. Oh, no. He's a Hebrew, all right. But to be raised in Pharaoh's palace as the only circumcised among all of your peers? Uh, would you be mocked as you're swimming in the Nile? Uh, is there just some difference there? Did, on the one hand, worst case scenario, is he embarrassed uh, by the token of the covenant? Something that sets him apart, made him odd man out? Uh, is there some kind of shame? I don't know. I Maybe best case scenario, it wasn't shame, but rather he hasn't been around covenant keepers at any point of his life, really. And perhaps he doesn't understand the true significance of the covenant that he, has, that he was born into. The covenant that God intends to keep. I remember my covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why do you think I'm freeing Israel? Do you remember that covenant? as well, or has a lifetime away from it made you take it for granted or underappreciate its significance to the point that you have not passed the covenant down to your son? That has to change. And if it takes me almost overcorrecting here, if it takes a shock and awe kind of response to slay you to understand that covenant keeping is, is a matter of life and death, and I want you to take it just that seriously, your spiritual life or death, then you must circumcise your son. And what's amazing here is Zipporah understands that instinctively. And so in the next verse, and we can use the Joseph Smith translation to add a little clarity, then Zipporah took a sharp stone and circumcised her son, right there, on the spot, immediately, acted, and cast the stone at his feet, probably Moses is there, and said, surely thou art a bloody husband unto me. Now, there's some strong language there. And like I said, the JST clarifies some things, but most of it is still right there in the King James original, which again has left people scratching their head for centuries. Like, what is Zipporah doing? 
I mean, rabbis have even taken that as like, wait, are women allowed to perform circumcisions? And some have argued yes, and others have argued no, and there's some other piece that we must be missing. And, well, there, there's Hebrew or rabbinic commentary for you, right? The old joke is that wherever there are two rabbis, there are three opinions. You could probably say the same thing about some of our church meetings. Uh, we, we can't even agree with ourselves at times. But what's interesting about Zipporah here, I see Rebecca 2.0. Remember, Rebecca was the proactive type uh, to make sure the covenant is passed down in the correct manner. Even if I have to pull a switcheroo with Jacob and Esau, I know that this is right. Uh, she's the proactive one to accept marriage when she's going in blindly uh, as far as physical eyes are concerned. Here's Zipporah doing the same thing. But, so she takes matters into her own hands, but she's also prioritizing the covenant in a way her husband had not and stepping in to just make it happen. And you sense some frustration on her part that she was the one that had to do it. Now, again, I don't know if this is Israelite versus Midianite circumcision practice, but I do sense that sometimes that to whatever degree that husbands are meant to preside in the home, and again, we're ruling with, not ruling over, and yes, we're equal partners here, but to whatever degree that there is hierarchy coupled with equality. There's that tricky uh, set of contraries to prove that we talked about in section 107, right? Under the direction of, but equal in authority to, and you get a similar sense in the proclamation to the world and the family. But I've sensed often that women who are waiting on their husbands to lead out in family prayer or family scripture study or family home evening or bring, helping the kids uh, receive priesthood ordination or progress in their callings, there are men that do that without their wives, and that's taking it too hot. But there are men who won't do that at all and expect their wives to do it all, and that's too cold. And is there a Goldilocks zone between those where we are proving contraries and presiding and seeking equality? And husbands are just as anxiously engaged in their children's spiritual progress as their wives are? That husbands are calling the family together for family prayer and family scripture study? Women are just as able to do that. I just wonder if some are waiting for their husband to exercise priesthood, to, to fulfill the measure of their creation, to lead in righteousness. Again, equal partners. But I do sense sometimes a certain frustration on the part of women. Why won't my husband lead? I'm happy to do it. I just don't want to... to step on his toes. I want to walk, I want those toes to be lined up together. I want both of us to be walking forward in tandem. And so throwing this stone at the foot of her husband, thou bloody husband unto me. Now, I don't know, had she suggested, sir, she's the daughter of the priest of Midian. Had she talked to Moses about circumcising their boys before? I don't know. This is one of those places I wish we had more information. Had she pleaded with him? Had she encouraged him? I don't know any of those details. Had he resisted? Is this an I told you so moment? I don't know. But what I do know is her, her willingness to act. And in the process, she's, she delivered the deliverer. Yet again, she saved her husband. And she passed the covenant down to their son. And every mother and father is meant to do that. The phrase, a bloody husband, is tricky. Uh, as is the, who's having this rock thrown down in front of them? I mean, the King James is the foreskin itself is being, is being thrown down. Who's the bloody husband? Well, the word would suggest, well, Moses. And she's bitter at Moses and frustrated with him. And some bl bloody husband you turned out to be. Um, this is not British swear words, by the way. Okay, there's something more significant about the blood that has just been shed. Blood of covenant, covenant, Father Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It's coming into this covenant, this relationship with God 
oh, so maybe Moses isn't the husband she's referring to. Maybe Gershom is. Because husband can also just be translated there as, as bridegroom. Uh, that's why some suggest that that kind of circumcision was in preparation for marriage. That word husband can be translated as son-in-law. Every time elsewhere in scripture where a son-in-law is mentioned, it's that same word that's used. And so that would also suggest like a son-in-law, that's someone entering a marriage. And so this husband, this son-in-law, this bridegroom. Now, Gershom's not old enough to get married. And so again, maybe we're thinking Moses. But if we're thinking him, it's like, well, he is old enough. In fact, was old enough at eight, at eight days old to become a a member of the covenant family of God. And so there's, I mean, even the footnote mentions bridegroom of blood with some kind of covenant significance in all of this. Is blood being shed to enter a covenant relationship? Marriage with a spouse is one level, but marriage to God is the real level here. And yes, he shed blood to make that relationship possible. He is the, the lamb without blemish, the ram that took the place of Isaac. There, there's something deep and meaningful here that I think we're still trying to stretch our minds around. Well, the next verse, again from the JST, the Lord spared Moses and let him go because Zipporah, his wife, circumcised the child. And she said, thou art a bloody husband and Moses was ashamed and hid his face from the Lord and said, I have sinned before the Lord. So Moses admits it. Similar to Judah, remember with Tamar, and he says, she's been more righteous than I have been. She did the right thing when I did the wrong thing. And so there is some culpability on Moses' part, and he recognizes that. I did not pass down the covenant as I was supposed to. And God, I am sorry for that. In fact, I am ashamed of that. And I am grateful for an help meet who was able to, to step in and deliver me like so many women have in the past and help meet that was able to pass down the covenant when for whatever reason I had, had failed to do so. The story, this part of the story then ends, verse 27, still JST. The Lord said unto Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the Mount of God, in the Mount where God appeared unto him. And Aaron kissed him. So here Aaron is receiving revelation as well. And I think it's then, once Aaron comes, that Zipporah, who has served a divine purpose this day, is then free to go back and bring her, her sons home to Jethro, where they will be safe from whatever happens, whatever's going to go down in Egypt. And Moses feels reassured. It's like the, the baton has been passed the rod, the crutch, <laughs> passes from Zipporah to Aaron. And brothers coming together, just as Moses had hoped and just as God had promised. Verse 28 then, Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. So here's a younger brother, Moses, who trusts his older brother, Aaron, with his own spiritual experiences. This reminds me of Joseph. Smith with his older brother Hiram, such a connection between those two, such bonds of brotherhood and such a trust that I can give my heart to you and it will be safe there. My spiritual experience is safe in your hand. Verse 29, then Moses and Aaron went, in fact, they went all the way back to Egypt and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. So they're involving those they are trying to lead. I mean, Moses has no relationship with the people of Israel. He feels that they're brethren. Do they feel that he is? Well, we've seen some evidence to the contrary. But they do have a relationship with the elders of Israel. They do trust them. And so if Moses can gain their trust, then they can help him lead. We're already seeing some delegation like Jethro will emphasize in a later chapter. Then verse 30 Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. So he's already functioning as Moses' mouthpiece. He's already showing those signs and wonders that, that uh, Moses had talked about, whether or not they need it. And remember, God had promised, they'll, they'll hearken to your voice. But hey, this is pretty amazing stuff. And if this helps confirm, maybe you already hearken and you have the faith. And faith precedes the miracle. 
you don't receive a witness till after the trial of your faith. Well, you passed the trial, and so here's the witness. And verse 31, the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. Now they worshipped God even before God had delivered them. But in that verse, oh, well, he's already visited us. He's already seen our affliction. If he's aware, then I will worship him. No matter how long it takes for that awareness to lead to actual deliverance. I think sometimes we hold off on worshiping God until, oh, everything, every promise has been received. And once you truly prove yourself, then okay, then I guess you've, you've earned my worship. No, worship for a simple awareness. God, in his infinity, would come down and, and seek an intimacy with me. That's enough for worship, that he would condescend. Well, chapter 4 then shifts to chapter 5, and here we see this whole chapter mostly focuses around the first failed attempt on Moses' part to get Pharaoh to let God's people go. And God had told Moses from the start, he's going to harden his own heart. It's not going to work the first time. There's, there's going to be some rounds. You had needed rounds of reassurance. Well, Pharaoh's going to need some rounds before we finally get redemption. And it's definitely not coming after round one. But here's round one for you. Verse 1, Afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go. We'll see that phrase repeated often next week. Let them go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. So again, we're not even asking for full freedom yet. But can you at least acknowledge our shared humanity? Can you realize that our religious desires, are they deserve to be made manifest? And can you honor some degree of religious freedom, if, even if you're not going to grant us full political freedom yet? Can you give us, can you lengthen the leash at least and treat us like human beings that deserve to go worship according to the dictates of our own conscience? No? Then, then God's demands will begin to change. So, verse 2, Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. I mean, I've got an entire Egyptian pantheon here from Osiris to Ra and everybody in between. I've got gods and goddesses for every day of the week, for every natural disaster. And I've never heard of the one you're talking about. A god of the Hebrews? Well, who's some god he turned out to be? He can't even keep his, his people out of, out of slavery. No, I'm not going there. It's interesting because we saw a similar problem with Cain not knowing God. In the Book of Mormon, it's repeated all over the place. You have Laman and Lemuel who know not the dealings of that God who created them. You have a King Benjamin, excuse me, a King, no, King Benjamin knew God. You have a King Noah saying to Abinadi, who's the Lord? You see the people of Ammonihah say to Alma, who's God? Uh, that's the biggest problem. In fact, it's usually coupled with a secondary problem, which is, and who are you, Mr. Mouthpiece? I don't know your God, and I certainly don't know you, nor do I care to. And that was Cain's problem, and King Noah's problem, and Laman Lemuel's problem, and the people of Ammonihah's problem as well. A failure to know God, and a failure to know his servants. And maybe failure is not the right word, maybe an unwillingness to come to know them, and to come to understand their will. Well, Pharaoh would not go there. And so in verse 3, they said to him, well, let's keep introducing. The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. You may not know him, but we sure do. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Maybe your <laughs> deniability is actually plausible. And you don't have to offer sacrifice to God. You don't know him. You're not accountable to him. But we know him now and are accountable to him now. And so we must go out and sacrifice. The irony there is if we don't, then pestilence will come or the sword. And what would Egypt eventually face? Pestilence and the sword. So let us 
honor God, even if you are unwilling to, but if you will not allow us to pay him homage, then there will be a price to pay, not just for us, but for you. Well, Pharaoh wasn't going to have any of that. So in verse 4, the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get you unto your burdens? In other words, mind your own business. This has nothing to do with you. You are not your brother's keepers. You leave. Actually, before you go, I've got another idea. You want the people to go so they can go out and, and play Israelite out in the wilderness? They want to go worship some god I've never heard of? It seems to have never heard of the people. He hasn't been there for them, obviously. Well, I've got a better idea. Verse 5, Pharaoh says, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. It's like, have your people multiplied so much that we have an overabundance of labor and not enough for them to do? Hmm, I can solve that problem. Uh, if they're just, what can I do with all these leisure hours since there's enough of us to subdivide the responsibilities? Let's go out in the wilderness and, and worship for a few days. No. In verse 6, Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, Ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. Now that verse speaks of both taskmasters and officers, and, and it seems that those are two different types of people. It seems that the taskmasters are probably Egyptians, and the officers are most likely Hebrews themselves but placed as kind of middlemen over their own people uh, and all the problems that that, can, that that can lead to. But when the, it says the same day, I mean, this is swift retribution. Uh, Moses and Aaron have been before Pharaoh one day and, and overnight Israel's lot has become worse rather than better. This is not going very well. And they weren't seeking time away because they were feeling lazy and had nothing better to do. They were already pushed to the absolute limit by these taskmasters and officers. And now they're going to have, they're going to have more to do. No longer will the straw be provided for you to make these mud bricks. Well, sure enough, verse 8, The tale of the bricks, which they did make heretofore, ye shall lay upon them. Ye shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. Therefore they cry, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let their more work be laid upon the men, that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. Now, do you understand Pharaoh's false assumption? They are idle. So let's give them more to do, since obviously they don't have enough to do. No, we don't give time to God because we have so much time to spare. If anything, we give time to God because we don't have time to spare. In this case, you know how time is money? Well, in this case, this kind of time lesson should follow the model of a tithing lesson. Because we don't give tithing because we have all this extra money. We give tithing because we don't have enough. And we know that God has promised to open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that will allow us to make ends meet. Uh, somehow, 90% plus God is greater than 100% without him. I know the math doesn't make a lot of sense, but spiritually it does. Since God is infinite, then yeah, 90% plus infinity definitely is more than 100% without infinity, right? Well, the same is true of time. And to me, there's something profound here about wanting to use time we don't even have to give to God, knowing that he can somehow do more with the time remaining than we could. Now, I please don't, if you're a toxic perfectionist, just fast forward the next little bit, okay? If you're already guilty of running faster than you have strength, then, then hit the mute button. But for those who are being diligent, but still worrying about, is there more I could do? Those who, or maybe this is even better, who are so busy with the world's work, that you don't seem to have space to carve out time for the things of God. I pray you don't fall into Pharaoh's trap to think that giving time to God can only be with extra hours. And it's leisure time that I can offer him. 
and that it will come at no sacrifice. That's probably the best way to put it. Pharaoh is assuming that your time to go make sacrifice will come as no sacrifice to you. Yeah, that's probably the best way to say it. Uh, and so for us, do we sometimes follow the, follow the same mental model that I can give God something out of my extra? Yeah. People say, oh, I can actually afford to pay tithing because I don't even need the 90%. Uh, so yeah, I won't even miss the 10% at all. No, it's those that the, for whom the 10% is a gut check and a test of faith and a real sacrifice. And then all of a sudden they see the multiplication of the 90% and and a, a miracle that follows on the heels of faith. To do that with time, will I make a sacrifice of time? And again, I'm preaching to the choir because here you are in whatever hour we're on in this lesson. But I pray that you're seeing God multiply your other hours. I pray that you are seeing the windows of heaven open and you be able to do more with the time that you have to do the world's work, to accomplish the other things on your to-do list, or maybe to know more clearly what should be on your to-do list and what shouldn't be. Maybe that's part of what we're looking for here. Now, there have been times that I've, as I've spoken with my students at Institute, uh, and I'll draw on the board a, what I describe as the two-sided hand cart. Now we all know what a handcart looks like, and there's a, an axle with the two wheels, and and the handcart is kind of resting on the axle, and then there's a place where you can pull it by. And I said, imagine this design for a handcart. I, I know it doesn't much, make much sense, but follow me through. Imagine if the the wheels were very large and the axle were about chest or waist high, but instead of having the bed of the handcart right above the axle. Imagine it being extended off in both directions, and there's two beds uh, at, on either extreme, and the wheels and axle are in the middle somehow. Now, I don't know if I described that well enough for you to envision this, but what ends up happening is you're standing in the middle of this contraption, pushing the axle forward, and there's a bed behind you and a bed in front of you that's supposed to keep all the stuff. Now, I know this sounds really, really weird, but here's where the analogy, I think, helps. We fill the bed of the handcart with all of our stuff, all of the world's expectations for us, and it's heavy with work and school and social life and everything else. And on top of that, God then says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And we're like, finally, that's what I need. I am laboring. I am heavy laden. I could use some rest. So you're, you're coming, or I'm coming to you so you can offload some of this stuff, right? And he says, well, not quite. Because that verse in Matthew continues, take my yoke upon you, learn of me. You're like, wait, wait, take your yoke? I thought you were taking mine. You're adding to my burden? Are you kidding me? No, I actually am asking you to do more uh, and serve in a calling and study your scriptures and pray and, and go to the temple and all these. But I don't have any space in my handcart to spare. I'm already over the weight maximum, and I can't move this thing. And that to me is where the two-sided handcart model comes in as superior to the one-sided. If we're picturing life as a one-sided handcart, the normal kind, and it's overloaded with all the cares of the world, and then God says, hey, can I dump some other stuff on you? Can I ask you to fulfill this calling? Can I have you do these other things? And you're like, I can barely move the cart as it is. But the two-sided model, this is where it comes in. Uh, as some good engineering. The world's wares and the world's worries are only on one side of the handcart. When God says, take my yoke upon you, it's the other side of the handcart that he's trying to fill. And what ends up happening? He sees us struggling against the, the wheels. He sees that side of all the wor world's weight dragging in the dirt. And he says, you know, I can actually make it easier on you by adding to your burden. If you'll take my yoke, it will help even things out. Because I'm not putting them in the handcart side that's already full. I'm putting them in the side that's empty. One bed is for the world. The other bed is for me. And amazingly, the more I add to that side, 
Yes, you're doing more. There's no denying it. Latter-day Saints are busy people, sometimes too busy, and that's the part, the part that we need to avoid. But, but sometimes we're so busy with all the good things of the world that for us to actually be able to handle it, we need the Lord as our yoke partner. We need that prayer. We need that scripture study. We need that service and temple worship to balance things. And as we do those things, as we take his yoke upon us, the world's weight doesn't seem quite so heavy. Yes, we're laboring, but we don't feel quite so heavy laden because it's more balanced. And best of all, Jesus joins us at the axle pushing right alongside. Honestly, that's how I got through high school. Uh, that's how I got through grad school uh, with way too much to do. And how on earth do you squeeze in time for scripture study or prayer? How do you serve in a calling? And for me, oh, it's the only thing keeping me afloat. It's the only thing that's giving me strength to be able to bear up under the world's work. It's the only thing allowing me to accomplish my daily task is seeking daily bread from the Lord. Again, I, without a chalkboard to, to draw all these things, I hope that the analogy, the visual aid has made sense to you. Uh, I just do have a testimony of, of balance and of God multiplying our hours because we've sacrificed some of it to him. Again, do not run faster than you have strength. I fear sometimes I'm guilty of that. And there are times the Lord does rein me in and say, you actually do need a little more downtime. But the two-sided handcart has been a blessing for me. Well, verse 10, the orders of Pharaoh are put into place. Again, the same day. The taskmasters of the people went out and their officers, and they spake to the people saying, thus saith Pharaoh, I will not give you straw, Go ye, get you straw where ye can find it, yet not aught of your work shall be diminished. Now, sadly, I think that describes the world we live in pretty well. A world that is asking us to do more with less. A world that is increasing its demands on us, but not giving any increase of supply. Especially the kind of supply that would allow us to truly meet Demands that really matter. See, that's what's interesting to me about straw. Oh, mud, you can get anywhere. We're on the banks of the Nile. It's, it's <laughs> omnipresent. But straw, that's going to be a little harder to come by, but it's absolutely essential for making mud bricks. You see, the mud isn't going to stick together unless there is straw in there for it to bind to and to bind itself. You see, the straw then is kind of connective tissue. And without the straw, the mud bricks will simply fall apart. And to me, that's, there's such a powerful symbol, that was a symbol there in terms of the straw. What is it that helps bind our life together? Now, we can th throw a, a mud brick together out of anything. And a little work here and some social life there and, and some entertainment here and whatever. But is there anything that gives substance to the whole? Is there anything that acts as as binding to make the other things meaningful. Anything bring it all together. And to me, that is spirituality. That is allowing God to be a part of our life because God sees the value of the world's work in your life. He sees the place of education and the place of entertainment and recreation and social life and everything else. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man, but it was it was who he was that kept all those things in proper balance. And I think so many of us get out of balance because it's all growing in wisdom and nothing else, or only growing in stature at the expense of other things, or we're spending all our time growing in favor with man and not enough time growing in favor with God. We're making bricks, but without any straw. And what's interesting to me about that is no wonder our mental health is suffering so much. Our rest isn't restful. Our, our recreation doesn't recreate us in a way that God would say is very good. My wife pointed that out, that recreation is recreation. 
And yet so often our recreation leaves us hot. It was like we have to get a vacation after our vacation to recover. Or our rest isn't very rest restful. Because what are we doing? We're just endlessly scrolling. We're just numbing the pain with mindless entertainment. There, there is so much need for rest and room for rest, even in our busy schedules. But may our rest be restful. And may our recreation be recreation. First was exercise. Maybe that was our grandparents' generation when they started making PE a required class in school. Because it's like our kids aren't getting enough exercise. Our pioneer ancestors would look at us going, not getting enough exercise? Isn't that your whole life? Isn't your whole life exercise? And you're like, well, not so much anymore. And then fast forward and went from exercise to nutrition. And we have the, the food groups and we have the food pyramid and all these things. And we got to teach our kids and we have to give them healthier snacks and school lunches and things. And again, our pioneer ancestors would be like, Health, you have to like plan for healthy food? What else is there? All there is is fruits and vegetables and grain and things. And you're like, well, we've created a few other options. <laughs> well, if we've gone from the need to inject exercise into our day and inject nutrition into our meals, well, now it's time to inject some mindfulness into our days, some mental health. Can you imagine? And again, our pioneer ancestors would be like, what? You got to take time to like stop and think and be mindful. Isn't that all you have time to do while you're out exercising in order to grow healthy foods? <laughs> Don't you just commune with God and, and ponder nature and, and think thoughts? And, and we're like, yeah, not so much anymore. We've filled those quiet times with not so quiet activities. Can you imagine having mindfulness time at school or at work? Time to take time to be holy. And honestly, it's the holiness that we should be seeking. My wife, I've said this before, is an addiction recovery counselor, and she's constantly talking with her patients about biopsychosocial spiritual. This is partly a biological problem that will require some biological solutions. It's partly a psychological problem that will require some counseling and psychological solutions. It's partly a social problem, and therefore you need connections so that social can be part of the solution. And yes, this is partly a spiritual problem. And you will never fully overcome it without spiritual solutions. Spirituality was such a deep part of the, or is such a deep part of the 12 Steps program in Alcoholics Anonymous or any of the other forms of addiction recovery. And to see the world all about the mud and not about the straw. All about productivity and not about spirituality. And no wonder we are crumbling under the weight of these, these monumental edifices that we are constructing out of bricks with no straw to hold them together. Lean into that spirituality. Take time to be holy. Find things that will draw together all the disparate aspects of your life. I know nothing better than the straw of scripture or the cohesion of covenant, the binding agent of brotherhood and sisterhood, of looking up to God and out to neighbor and taking up that cross daily. There will be a place to hang every other thing that you need to hold on to. But without it, life really does seem to fall apart. In verse 12, the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. How will that hold things together? The taskmasters hasted them, saying, Fulfill your works, your daily tasks, as when there was straw. Verse 14, the officers of the children of Israel, which Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and demanded, Wherefore have you not fulfilled your tasks in making brick both yesterday and today as heretofore? That's what makes me wonder if the officers were actually Israelites. It seems so. It's like they're pitting, like the Egyptian taskmasters are pitting Hebrews against Hebrews. And these officers can't get their own people to be able to produce as much as they were required. Again, all this happening overnight well, verse 15, Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried unto Pharaoh, saying, Wherefore dealest thou thus with thy servants? There is no straw given unto thy servants. 
And they say to us, Make brick, and behold, thy servants are beaten. But the fault is in thine own people. You see what the Israelites are up against? You are making demands of us that are impossible to fulfill. Make bricks, but no straw? And then you beat us for not being able to fulfill those impossible demands when you're the one to blame for it to, for, to begin with? You are requiring the product without supplying the parts. You are demanding the dish while withholding the ingredients. This is like society wanting order without community, or health without exercise, or diet without nutrition, or mental health without mindfulness, success without work, or morality without religion, progress without self-sacrifice, wholeness without spirituality, conviction without faith, peace of mind without repentance. They're wanting salvation without God, and that's impossible. I've always loved the statement from Augustine who said, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. In other words, we all have a God-shaped hole in our hearts. And we spend so much time stuffing at that hole with things that we hope will fill up the space and, and drown out that voice that's telling us we're missing something. No, it's Abraham wanting greater happiness and peace and rest, but knowing where it was to be found. And it's to be found in God. And nothing else can fill that hole like he can. Well, Pharaoh doesn't believe that, doesn't understand it. And so what does he say? Ye are idle. Ye are idle. Therefore ye say, let us go and do sacrifice to the Lord. Go therefore now and work, for there shall no straw be given you. Yet shall ye deliver the tale of bricks. To which we would say, no, it's not that we are idle that makes us want to worship God. In fact, if anything, it's being idle that makes you want to worship your idols, your false gods of Egypt. We talked about this repeatedly in the Book of Mormon, how often idleness, I-D-L-E, was linked to idleness, I-D-O-L. Idleness and idolatry are 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 tied together, whereas worship and work are bound as well. It's not that we're idle. It's that we're overworked. And we need God now more than ever. In verse 19, the officers of the children of Israel did see that they were in evil case. In other words, in trouble. After it was said, ye shall not minish aught from your bricks of your daily task. It's like, we're, we're dead men then. There's no way they're going to be able to keep up with the quota and we can't force them to, because it's literally impossible. And here we are as middlemen between the slaves and the taskmasters, and, and we are in an impossible situation. In verse 20, they met Moses and Aaron, who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh. And they said unto them, The Lord look upon you and judge, because you have made our Savior to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants, to put a sword in their hand to slay us. Other translations put it as, you have made us odious or repulsive, or you've made us stink before Pharaoh and his people. Now, was it Moses and Aaron that were causing that? Were they to blame? We'll see the same thing with Elijah and Ahab in a later, uh, a later book in the Old Testament. But to say, what well, is interesting, they met Moses and Aaron as they stood in the way. Well, in a way, prophets and apostles do that. They do stand in the way when we are barreling off to our own destruction. They stand in the way when the world is trying to overwork us and they offer us a better way. But these overseers, they don't get that. They're blaming Moses and Aaron when it's the Egyptians to, that are to blame. It's Pharaoh that is to blame. You've put a sword in their hand? Like it or not, they've always had that sword in their hand. And they have been slaying you slowly and steadily for centuries. That's what slavery is. So don't think that all of a sudden the Egyptians are looking down on you as odious. They've always looked down on you. It's just becoming so much more clear because someone is finally standing up to them. And that's what Moses and Aaron are doing. In verse 22, Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, Wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? 
In other words, why have you brought on all this trouble for them? Why is it that thou hast sent me? I'm, I'm only making matters worse, that is. For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people. Neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. This is Moses' equivalent of what Rebekah had said when she finally had the miracle of being pregnant. And yet it was such a difficult oh, pregnancy that she said, Lord, if it be so, why, then why am I thus? God, if I'm really called by you, Moses is thinking, then why am I making things worse? I knew that you picked the wrong person. How, how would God respond? Moses, no, you don't understand. But if you thought it would be easy from the get-go, why do you think I warned you from the start? Pharaoh will harden his heart, that there will be ups and downs along this journey, and don't assume that just because I've called you, and just because you are an instrument in my hand, that I will totally override someone else's agency. No, we're going to work within the parameters. We're going to try to help Pharaoh change, or at least treat him in such a way that he deserves whatever justice he receives when all is said and done. More than that, Moses, for you, for Aaron, for all the people of Israel, they're going to need to know of the mighty hand of God. And might is often most visible when it is up against some other might. And so to see Pharaoh standing, he's the one that's in the way. We will overcome, but not as easily as you imagined. One of my favorite lines from Thomas Paine was written in the very first uh, essay of the American crisis. He'd already written uh, Common Sense and the colonies were up in arms ready to, to declare their own freedom from Great Britain. And yet when it didn't come as easily as they thought and General Washington was suffering defeats instead of rejoicing in victories and the, the colonists were starting to wonder did we do the wrong thing? And will we, will we have to pay a price for our treason? Payne writes in that first edition of the American Crisis, what we obtain too cheaply, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods, and it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. There would be no summer soldiers or sunshine patriots for pain. He understood the value of what they were fighting for and that it was worth whatever price they would have to pay. Did the Israelites feel the same? Did Moses get it? What you are seeking, deliverance, will come at a cost, but it is worth whatever sacrifice is required of you. In some ways, it reminds me of in the Book of Mormon, the deliverance of the people of Limhi. Remember Ammon comes in, not the one that chops off the arms. Uh, an earlier Ammon comes. He's the Moses figure in this story because he's come seeking Limhi's people to, and, and they realize our deliverer has finally come. We can get out from under the Lamanite thumb. Well, King Limhi says an interesting thing to his people. He realizes that deliverance is on its way. In some ways, its personification has just arrived. They see the evidence of God working for them. But they also realize it's not going to be an easy escape. That even goes along with what Moses has said at the end there. He's only done evil to this people, Pharaoh has, and you have not delivered thy people at all. That interesting. You haven't even done anything to deliver them yet. They haven't seen any. It's only gotten worse. And in some ways, I think if it were Limhi, he'd be pushing back saying, no, 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 no. We're seeing the deliverance of God already because Ammon's here. We have evidence that God has seen our burdens and heard our cries and knows our anguish because he has sent our deliverer. No, we haven't seen actual deliverance yet, but we're, the deliverance is already beginning. And so, again, what does Limhi say to his people? It's so powerful. O ye my people, lift up your heads and be comforted. For behold, the time is at hand, or is not far distant, when we shall no longer be in subjection to our enemies, notwithstanding our many strugglings, which have been in vain. Yet I trust there remaineth an effectual struggle to be made. 
That is such a powerful phrase. It's one worth memorizing. That there remaineth an effectual struggle to be made. Limhi goes on and reminds his people of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He reminds them of the God of the Exodus and promises, reassures them that he will also be the God of their Exodus. And he was. He will be the God of your Exodus as well. He sees, he knows, he hears, he understands, and he's already working out your deliverance. In many ways, he already has. Do we see it? And are we willing to endure an effectual struggle to fight for the freedom that he's promised us or the blessings that he has laid up in store? Well, chapter 5 ends with that, that concern on Moses' part. But then chapter 6 begins with another reassurance. Round after round, and Moses needs every one. Chapter 6, verse 1, Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. That strong hand will be the Lord's. And yes, Pharaoh will feel the weight, the heavy hand of God. In verse 2, God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty. That's El Shaddai in Hebrew. That's how he appeared to them. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. Now that name, Jehovah, is an English variation on those four letters, uh, the tetragrammaton they call it in Greek, that now we typically read as Yahweh. When you see in the King James Bible, Lord in all capital letters, that's Yahweh. That is, I am that I am. That is Jehovah as you take the, the Y and the H and the W and the H and change it into more English-sounding letters. Uh, that's where we get the name Jehovah. Now, there it says, by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. But the Joseph Smith translation clarifies and corrects that. It reads, I am the Lord God Almighty, there's El Shaddai, the Lord Jehovah. So a clarification upon that other title. And was not my name known unto them? So in the JST, it's phrased as a question. And one difficulty of Hebrew, without punctuation marks and without vowels, is sometimes it is difficult to know, is this a statement or is it a question? So even in the King James, but by my name Jehovah, was I not known to them? I mean, add the inflection at the end into a question, and that's more what he is saying. I was known to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They knew I was the Almighty, El Shaddai. They knew I was Jehovah the self-existent one, the one who is and can call into being. They trusted me. Moses, you have to trust me too. I introduced myself to you at the burning bush, and now I introduce myself to you again. Not from the safe distance of Sinai, but right here in the thick of your trials, your circumstances. Your hand is now in your bosom, and I know you are afraid of leprosy coming as a result. Trust me, all will be well. Pick up that serpent by the tail, and a stick is all he will end up being. Well, verse 4, I have also established my covenant with them, your fathers, to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. This is the Abrahamic covenant. I know your fathers. I remember them. I remember the promises that I made to them, and I am here to fulfill them to the letter through you, Moses. If you'll simply believe in me, do you have faith to know you have not been forgotten? In verse 6, he continues, Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. In that verse, the I am becomes the I will. And he promises, I will do all of those things for you. In verse 7, I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. 
We seem to come to know God as he delivers us. I don't know a better way to forge that relationship than through repentance. In my own experience, those have been the times I have usually felt closest to him because I see him delivering me from my, from my lesser self. And so in that promise, I will rid you of your bondage. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm. I'll take you for a people. You'll be my people if you'll have me to be your God. And then that amazing line, you'll know that I'm the Lord your God. I've said this before, but life has to be just hard enough for us to know that we haven't done it on our own. Or as I've sometimes learned also, if you think you can do something on your own, God will usually let you try. <laughs> and then when you crash and burn and come to yourself, you realize I really did need God's help all along. That's often why things are difficult to introduce us to our need for God. It's what Nephi learned in 1 Nephi 17 as they're beginning their exodus from a difficult situation towards their promised land. And they're put in, in hard situations, no fire to cook their food, for example, no light for the, for the journey at, during the nighttime. And what's the Lord say? That it needs to be this way. It needs to be hard. And here's why. And ye shall know that it is by me that ye are led. It has to be hard enough to prove to you that you didn't do it by yourself. And this is part of that effectual struggle yet to be made. In verse 8, God continues his promise. I will bring you in unto the land, concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and I will give it you for an heritage. I am the Lord. That end there, which we'll see repeated so often in Leviticus coming up. I am the Lord. There's my name signed on the dotted line. You have my word on it. In verse 9, Moses spake so unto the children of Israel. That reassurance seemed to be enough for him. But they, the people, hearkened not unto Moses. And here's why. For anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. I've often heard that when there's a dog growling or barking at you, be patient and look for the thorn in the paw. There's probably something causing that. And in this case, these Israelites who hearkened earlier when Moses had come with the good news, not realizing there was still an effectual struggle. And now, as things have gotten worse before they get better, it's, I don't know if I can trust like I did when you first showed up. And they're having a harder time hearkening to him. But it was because of their anguish of spirit. It was due to their cruel bondage. And I hope that we can see that when people are suffering or struggling, if they're not being their best selves or their most oh, dedicated disciples, often it's because of circumstance. It's because of what they're going through. And not to make excuses, but simply to, to offer an explanation look past their outward attitude and try to perceive their set of circumstances. And perhaps you'll be a little bit more patient with people who struggle. Verse 10, the Lord then says to Moses, Go in, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that he let the children of Israel go out of his land. And ultimately, he's the one that's going to have to obey anyway. And everything he goes through is, are things that Israel will go through as well, largely. And they will come to trust me. They will come to hearken to your voice once again. But go to Pharaoh. Don't give up so easily. But Moses still struggles, just as the people did. He's truly one of them. And in verse 12, he spake before the Lord, saying, Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me, who am of uncircumcised lips? If my own people won't listen to me, how can I possibly convince Pharaoh? I, I, I warned you about my inadequacy. I have not just slow of speech, I have uncircumcised lips. It's like what Paul said about uncircumcised hearts. It goes back to what Zipporah had to help him with. Of, are we taking the covenant seriously? In that instance, it was more about obedience. In this instance, it's more about trust. I just... I have uncircumcised his lips. I, I need to cut away whatever is covering my weakness. I need to fully expose to you 
how much I need your help. Well, God is aware of that. But if we will approach him in humility, then yes, our weak things can become strong. And we'll see a lot of that strength next week with the plagues of Egypt and the courage that Moses begins to exude right there in Pharaoh's court. Verse 13, God will reconfirm those marching orders. The Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron and gave them a charge unto the children of Israel and unto Pharaoh king of Egypt to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. This is your mission, Moses, should you choose to accept it. And it is not a mission impossible as long as I am with you. So trust in me. The chapter then ends with a review of the genealogy of, excuse me, the descendants of Reuben and Simeon and Levi. And then stops with Levi because it finally caught up to Moses and Aaron, the heroes of our story. And thus ends this week's study, setting us up for an incredible sequel next week as, as all heaven breaks loose to convince Pharaoh that, oh, I'm the God you didn't know. Please allow me to introduce myself. And Israel, if you've ever felt forgotten, then remember this. And they have ever since. I hope that we remember it as well. But as we talked about, or as we close with these two heroes, Moses and Aaron, I do want to remind us of all the hero wins that went before them. Of Shifra and Pua, of Yocheved, of Miriam, of Pharaoh's daughter, of Zipporah. All of these deliverers of the deliverer. Years ago, there was a talk given at BYU by a professor there that described this Oh, this siege of a castle in Germany, I think in the 12th century. And this enemy was coming and knocking down the walls and ready to destroy the, this whole city. And then he had a little twinge of compassion, but only for the women. He thought, oh, the women aren't to blame for this. And I just want to slay their husbands and, and take the spoils of war. So I'll tell you what, I will allow all of the women and children to leave. And I'll allow the women to carry anything on their backs and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll let them escape. Well, these were enterprising women. These were deliverers themselves. And so when the, the gates of the castle or the, the city opened, out trudged these women under massive loads because each of them had hoisted their husbands upon their backs and we're carrying them out to safety. The, the enemy who was there was so impressed with their sense of sacrifice and their loyalty to those they loved that he honored what he had offered them. And although he leveled this city, there was no loss of life because these courageous women had become protectors of what they held most dear. That is a lesson to be followed and learned by each of us, female as well as male. Like Joseph Smith said, the nearer we approach God, the more we look with compassion upon perishing souls. We want to lift them upon our shoulders and cast their sins behind their backs. And that's what these worthy and righteous women did for Moses in hopes that Moses would someday do the same for all of them. But to do that, for them to do that, for any of us to do that, we will have to be able to find straw for our bricks. We will have to warm ourselves by the burning bush and take our shoes off so that we can ground ourselves in, in the dirt and seek the divinity that lies above us so that God can guide us through these missions in mortality. There's so much in these stories that we've studied today. We'll have to lay hold on the covenant. We'll have to make whatever sacrifices are required to come to know the God of our deliverance. And that requires a certain centering of the soul. Years ago when Elder Holland was president of BYU, he got to speak there often, 
And that's a treasure trove of amazing messages. But his wife, Patricia, got to speak with him often. They sometimes call it the Jeff and Pat show. And she is no, not one whit behind her husband. She gave a talk about the soul's center once that really stuck with me. And talking about this, oh, the centrifugal force, so to speak, of a world that's trying to tear us apart. I picture mud bricks starting to crumble. And the way she described what we're up against and the way we can find help to get us through those days, it really is a centering of soul. It is looking for the straw that only the Spirit can provide. And she said, we often worry so much about pleasing and performing for others that we lose our own uniqueness, that full and relaxed acceptance of ourselves as a person of worth and individuality. Too many women, and we could add men, watch helplessly as their lives unravel from the core that centers and sustains them. Where is the inner stillness we so cherish? She then quoted Anne Morrow Lindbergh, who said, we are aware of our hunger and needs, but still ignorant of what will satisfy them. With our garnered free time, we are more apt to drain our creative springs than to refill them. With our pitchers, we attempt to water a field instead of a garden. Not knowing how to feed the spirit, we try to muffle its demands in distractions. Instead of stilling the center, the axis of the wheel, we add more centrifugal activities to our lives, which tend to throw us off balance. No wonder our mud bricks tend to crumble under the weight of the world. No wonder we need to turn to God in our afflictions, trusting that he has heard and seen and knows all that we're going through. No wonder we need to look around and see others in need of deliverance and step in to save them as Moses did for others and as so many others did for Moses. My friends, we've seen so many stories today. I hope that you see yourself in them. And I hope you see a Father in heaven who lovingly is trying to reach out even to you. He is the Almighty God. He is the great I Am. And any time you feel a stirring of the Spirit, I testify it is Him reaching out to you, if you will only turn aside to see.